Section one of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. An inquiry concerning the principles of morals by David Hume. Section one of the general principles of morals disputes with men pertinaciously obstinate in their principles are of all others the most irksome except perhaps those with persons entirely disingenuous who really do not believe the opinions they defend but engage in the controversy from affectation from a spirit of opposition or from a desire of showing wit and ingenuity superior to the rest of mankind the same blind adherence to their own arguments is to be expected in both the same contempt of their antagonists and the same passionate vehemence in enforcing sophistry and falsehood and as reasoning is not the source whence either disputant derives his tenets it is in vain to expect that any logic which speaks not to the affections will ever engage him to embrace sounder principles those who have denied the reality of moral distinctions may be ranked among the disingenuous disputants nor is it conceivable that any human creature could ever seriously believe that all characters and actions were alike entitled to the affection and regard of every one the difference which nature has placed between one man and another is so wide and this difference is still so much farther widened by education example and habit that where the opposite extremes come at once under our apprehension there is no scepticism so scrupulous and scarce any assurance so determined as absolutely to deny all distinction between them let a man's insensibility be ever so great he must often be touched with the images of right and wrong and let his prejudices be ever so obstinate he must observe that others are susceptible of like impressions the only way therefore of converting an antagonist of this kind is to leave him to himself for finding that nobody keeps up the controversy with him it is probable he will at last of himself from mere weariness come over to the side of common sense and reason there has been a controversy started of late much better worth examination concerning the general foundation of morals whether they be derived from reason or from sentiment whether we attain the knowledge of them by a chain of argument and induction or by an immediate feeling and finer internal sense whether like all sound judgment of truth and falsehood they should be the same to every rational intelligent being or whether like the perception of beauty and deformity they be founded entirely on the particular fabric and constitution of the human species the ancient philosophers though they often affirm that virtue is nothing but conformity to reason yet in general seem to consider morals as deriving their existence from taste and sentiment on the other hand our modern inquirers though they also talk much of the beauty of virtue and deformity of vice yet have commonly endeavoured to account for these distinctions by metaphysical reasonings and by deductions from the most abstract principles of the understanding such confusion reigned in these subjects that an opposition of the greatest consequence could prevail between one system and another and even in the parts of almost each individual system and yet nobody till very lately was ever sensible of it the elegant lord shaftesbury who first gave occasion to remark this distinction and who in general adhered to the principles of the ancients is not himself entirely free from the same confusion it must be acknowledged that both sides of the question are susceptible of specious arguments moral distinctions it may be said are discernible by pure reason else whence the many disputes that reign in common life as well as in philosophy with regard to this subject 
the long chain of proofs often produced on both sides the examples cited the authorities appealed to the analogies employed the fallacies detected the inferences drawn and the several conclusions adjusted to their proper principles truth is disputable not taste what exists in the nature of things is the standard of our judgment what each man feels within himself is the standard of sentiment propositions in geometry may be proved systems in physics may be controverted but the harmony of verse the tenderness of passion the brilliancy of wit must give immediate pleasure no man reasons concerning another's beauty but frequently concerning the justice or injustice of his actions in every criminal trial the first object of the prisoner is to disprove the facts alleged and deny the actions imputed to him the second to prove that even if these actions were real they might be justified as innocent and lawful it is confessedly by deductions of the understanding that the first point is ascertained how can we suppose that a different faculty of the mind is employed in fixing the other on the other hand those who would resolve all moral determinations into sentiment may endeavour to show that it is impossible for reason ever to draw conclusions of this nature to virtue say they it belongs to be amiable and vice odious this forms their very nature or essence but can reason or argumentation distribute these different epithets to any subjects and pronounce beforehand that this must produce love and that hatred or what other reason can we ever assign for these affections but the original fabric and formation of the human mind which is naturally adapted to receive them the end of all moral speculations is to teach us our duty and by proper representations of the deformity of vice and beauty of virtue beget correspondent habits and engage us to avoid the one and embrace the other but is this ever to be expected from inferences and conclusions of the understanding which of themselves have no hold of the affections or set in motion the active powers of men they discover truths but where the truths which they discover are indifferent and beget no desire or aversion they can have no influence on conduct and behaviour what is honourable what is fair what is becoming what is noble what is generous takes possession of the heart and animates us to embrace and maintain it what is intelligible what is evident what is probable what is true procures only the cool assent of the understanding and gratifying a speculative curiosity puts an end to our researches extinguish all the warm feelings and prepossessions in favour of virtue and all disgust or aversion to vice render men totally indifferent towards these distinctions and morality is no longer a practical study nor has any tendency to regulate our lives and actions these arguments on each side and many more might be produced are so plausible that i am apt to suspect they may the one as well as the other be solid and satisfactory and that reason and sentiment concur in almost all moral determinations and conclusions the final sentence it is probable which pronounces characters and actions amiable or odious praiseworthy or blamable that which stamps on them the mark of honour or infamy approbation or censure that which renders morality an active principle and constitutes virtue our happiness and vice our misery it is probable i say that this final sentence depends on some internal sense or feeling which nature has made universal in the whole species for what else can have an influence of this nature but in order to pave the way for such a sentiment and give a proper discernment of its object 
it is often necessary we find that much reasoning should precede that nice distinctions be made just conclusions drawn distant comparisons formed complicated relations examined and general facts fixed and ascertained some species of beauty especially the natural kinds on their first appearance command our affection and approbation and where they fail of this effect it is impossible for any reasoning to redress their influence or adapt them better to our taste and sentiment but in many orders of beauty particularly those of the finer arts it is requisite to employ much reasoning in order to feel the proper sentiment and a false relish may frequently be corrected by argument and reflection there are just grounds to conclude that moral beauty partakes much of this latter species and demands the assistance of our intellectual faculties in order to give it a suitable influence on the human mind but though this question concerning the general principles of morals be curious and important it is needless for us at present to employ farther care in our researches concerning it for if we can be so happy in the course of this inquiry as to discover the true origin of morals it will then easily appear how far either sentiment or reason enters into all determinations of this nature in order to attain this purpose we shall endeavour to follow a very simple method we shall analyse that complication of mental qualities which form what in common life we call personal merit we shall consider every attribute of the mind which renders a man an object either of esteem and affection or of hatred and contempt every habit or sentiment or faculty which if ascribed to any person implies either praise or blame and may enter into any panegyric or satire of his character and manners the quick sensibility which on this head is so universal among mankind gives a philosopher sufficient assurance that he can never be considerably mistaken in framing the catalogue or incur any danger of misplacing the objects of his contemplation he needs only enter into his own breast for a moment and consider whether or not he should desire to have this or that quality ascribed to him and whether such or such an imputation would proceed from a friend or an enemy the very nature of language guides us almost infallibly in forming a judgment of this nature and as every tongue possesses one set of words which are taken in a good sense and another in the opposite the least acquaintance with the idiom suffices without any reasoning to direct us in collecting and arranging the estimable or blamable qualities of men the only object of reasoning is to discover the circumstances on both sides which are common to these qualities to observe that particular in which the estimable qualities agree on the one hand and the blamable on the other and thence to reach the foundation of ethics and find those universal principles from which all censure or approbation is ultimately derived as this is a question of fact not of abstract science we can only expect success by following the experimental method and deducing general maxims from a comparison of particular instances the other scientific method where a general abstract principle is first established and is afterwards branched out into a variety of inferences and conclusions may be more perfect in itself but suits less the imperfection of human nature and is a common source of illusion and mistake in this as well as in other subjects men are now cured of their passion for hypotheses and systems in natural philosophy and will hearken to no arguments but those which are derived from experience it is full time they should attempt a like reformation in all moral disquisitions and reject every system of ethics however subtle or ingenious which is not founded on fact and observation
we shall begin our inquiry on this head by the consideration of the social virtues benevolence and justice the explication of them will probably give us an opening by which the others may be accounted for end of section one section two of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by ruth golding an inquiry concerning the principles of morals by david hume section two of benevolence part one it may be esteemed perhaps a superfluous task to prove that the benevolent or softer affections are estimable and wherever they appear engage the approbation and good will of mankind the epithets sociable good-natured humane merciful grateful friendly generous beneficent or their equivalents are known in all languages and universally express the highest merit which human nature is capable of attaining where these amiable qualities are attended with birth and power and eminent abilities and display themselves in the good government or useful instruction of mankind they seem even to raise the possessors of them above the rank of human nature and make them approach in some measure to the divine exalted capacity undaunted courage prosperous success these may only expose a hero or politician to the envy and ill-will of the public but as soon as the praises are added of humane and beneficent when instances are displayed of lenity tenderness or friendship envy itself is silent or joins the general voice of approbation and applause when pericles the great athenian statesman and general was on his deathbed his surrounding friends deeming him now insensible began to indulge their sorrow for their expiring patron by enumerating his great qualities and successes his conquests and victories the unusual length of his administration and his nine trophies erected over the enemies of the republic you forget cries the dying hero who had heard all you forget the most eminent of my praises while you dwell so much on those vulgar advantages in which fortune had a principal share you have not observed that no citizen has ever yet worn mourning on my account plutarch in Pericle. in men of more ordinary talents and capacity the social virtues become if possible still more essentially requisite there being nothing eminent in that case to compensate for the want of them or preserve the person from our severest hatred as well as contempt a high ambition an elevated courage is apt says cicero in less perfect characters to degenerate into a turbulent ferocity the more social and softer virtues are there chiefly to be regarded these are always good and amiable cicero de officiis lib one the principal advantage which juvenal discovers in the extensive capacity of the human species is that it renders our benevolence also more extensive and gives us larger opportunities of spreading our kindly influence than what are indulged to the inferior creation satire fifteen lines one three nine and sec it must indeed be confessed that by doing good only can a man truly enjoy the advantages of being eminent his exalted station of itself but the more exposes him to danger and tempest his sole prerogative is to afford shelter to inferiors who repose themselves under his cover and protection but i forget that it is not my present business to recommend generosity and benevolence or to paint in their true colours all the genuine charms of the social virtues these indeed sufficiently engage every heart on the first apprehension of them 
and it is difficult to abstain from some sally of panegyric as often as they occur in discourse or reasoning but our object here being more the speculative than the practical part of morals it will suffice to remark what will readily i believe be allowed that no qualities are more entitled to the general goodwill and approbation of mankind than beneficence and humanity friendship and gratitude natural affection and public spirit or whatever proceeds from a tender sympathy with others and a generous concern for our kind and species these wherever they appear seem to transfuse themselves in a manner into each beholder and to call forth in their own behalf the same favourable and affectionate sentiments which they exert on all around End of section two. Section three of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume Section 2 of Benevolence, Part 2 We may observe that in displaying the praises of any humane, beneficent man, there is one circumstance which never fails to be amply insisted on, namely the happiness and satisfaction derived to society from his intercourse and good offices to his parents we are apt to say he endears himself by his pious attachment and duteous care still more than by the connections of nature his children never feel his authority but when employed for their advantage with him the ties of love are consolidated by beneficence and friendship the ties of friendship approach in a fond observance of each obliging office to those of love and inclination his domestics and dependents have in him a sure resource and no longer dread the power of fortune but so far as she exercises it over him from him the hungry receive food the naked clothing the ignorant and slothful skill and industry like the sun an inferior minister of providence he cheers invigorates and sustains the surrounding world if confined to private life the sphere of his activity is narrower but his influence is all benign and gentle if exalted into a higher station mankind and posterity reap the fruit of his labours as these topics of praise never fail to be employed and with success where we would inspire esteem for any one may it not thence be concluded that the utility resulting from the social virtues forms at least a part of their merit and is one source of that approbation and regard so universally paid to them when we recommend even an animal or a plant as useful and beneficial we give it an applause and recommendation suited to its nature as on the other hand reflection on the baneful influence of any of these inferior beings always inspires us with the sentiment of aversion the eye is pleased with the prospect of cornfields and loaded vineyards horses grazing and flocks pasturing but flies the view of briars and brambles affording shelter to wolves and serpents a machine a piece of furniture a vestment a house well contrived for use and conveniency is so far beautiful and is contemplated with pleasure and approbation an experienced eye is here sensible to many excellencies which escape persons ignorant and uninstructed can anything stronger be said in praise of a profession such as merchandise or manufacture than to observe the advantages which it procures to society and is not a monk and inquisitor enraged when we treat his order as useless or pernicious to mankind the historian exults in displaying the benefit arising from his labours 
the writer of romance, alleviates or denies the bad consequences ascribed to his manner of composition. In general, what praise is implied in the simple epithet useful? What reproach in the contrary? Your gods, says Cicero, de natura deorum lib one, in opposition to the Epicureans, cannot justly claim any worship or adoration with whatever imaginary perfections you may suppose them endowed. They are totally useless and inactive. Even the Egyptians, whom you so much ridicule, never consecrated any animal but on account of its utility. The sceptics assert, Sextus Empiricus Adversus Mathematicos Lib. 8, though absurdly, that the origin of all religious worship was derived from the utility of inanimate objects as the sun and moon to the support and well-being of mankind. This is also the common reason assigned by historians for the deification of eminent heroes and legislators. Diodora Siculus Passim To plant a tree, to cultivate a field, to beget children, meritorious acts according to the religion of Zoroaster. In all determinations of morality, this circumstance of public utility is ever principally in view and wherever disputes arise, either in philosophy or common life, concerning the bounds of duty, the question cannot by any means be decided with greater certainty than by ascertaining on any side the true interests of mankind. If any false opinion embraced from appearances has been found to prevail, as soon as farther experience and sounder reasoning have given us juster notions of human affairs, we retract our first sentiment, and adjust anew the boundaries of moral good and evil. Giving alms to common beggars is naturally praised, because it seems to carry relief to the distressed and indigent. But when we observe the encouragement thence arising to idleness and debauchery, we regard that species of charity rather as a weakness than a virtue. Tyrannicide, or the assassination of usurpers and oppressive princes, was highly extolled in ancient times, because it both freed mankind from many of these monsters, and seemed to keep the others in awe whom the sword or poignard could not reach. But history and experience having since convinced us that this practice increases the jealousy and cruelty of princes, a Timoleon and a Brutus, though treated with indulgence on account of the prejudices of their times, are now considered as very improper models for imitation. Liberality in princes is regarded as a mark of beneficence, but when it occurs that the homely bread of the honest and industrious is often thereby converted into delicious cates for the idle and the prodigal, we soon retract our heedless praises. The regrets of a prince for having lost a day were noble and generous, but had he intended to have spent it in acts of generosity to his greedy courtiers, it was better lost than misemployed after that manner. Luxury, or a refinement on the pleasures and conveniences of life, had long been supposed the source of every corruption in government, and the immediate cause of faction, sedition, civil wars, and the total loss of liberty. It was, therefore, universally regarded as a vice, and was an object of declamation to all satirists and severe moralists. Those who prove or attempt to prove that such refinements rather tend to the increase of industry, civility and arts, regulate anew our moral as well as political sentiments, and represent as laudable or innocent what had formerly been regarded as pernicious and blamable. Upon the whole, then, it seems undeniable that nothing can bestow more merit on any human creature than the sentiment of benevolence in an eminent degree, and that a part at least of its merit arises from its tendency to promote the interests of our species, and bestow happiness on human society. 
we carry our view into the salutary consequences of such a character and disposition and whatever has so benign an influence and forwards so desirable an end is beheld with complacency and pleasure the social virtues are never regarded without their beneficial tendencies nor viewed as barren and unfruitful the happiness of mankind the order of society the harmony of families the mutual support of friends are always considered as the result of their gentle dominion over the breasts of men how considerable a part of their merit we ought to ascribe to their utility will better appear from future disquisitions as well as the reason why this circumstance has such a command over our esteem and approbation End of section three. Section four of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. An inquiry concerning the principles of morals by David Hume. Section three of Justice, part one that justice is useful to society and consequently that part of its merit at least must arise from that consideration it would be a superfluous undertaking to prove that public utility is the sole origin of justice and that reflections on the beneficial consequences of this virtue are the sole foundation of its merit this proposition being more curious and important will better deserve our examination and inquiry let us suppose that nature has bestowed on the human race such profuse abundance of all external conveniences that without any uncertainty in the event without any care or industry on our part every individual finds himself fully provided with whatever his most voracious appetites can want or luxurious imagination wish or desire his natural beauty we shall suppose surpasses all acquired ornaments the perpetual clemency of the seasons renders useless all clothes or covering the raw herbage affords him the most delicious fare the clear fountain the richest beverage no laborious occupation required no tillage no navigation music poetry and contemplation form his sole business conversation mirth and friendship his sole amusement it seems evident that in such a happy state every other social virtue would flourish and receive tenfold increase but the cautious jealous virtue of justice would never once have been dreamed of for what purpose make a partition of goods where every one has already more than enough why give rise to property where there cannot possibly be any injury why call this object mine when upon the seizing of it by another i need but stretch out my hand to possess myself to what is equally valuable justice in that case being totally useless would be an idle ceremonial and could never possibly have place in the catalogue of virtues we see even in the present necessitous condition of mankind that wherever any benefit is bestowed by nature in an unlimited abundance we leave it always in common among the whole human race and make no subdivisions of right and property water and air though the most necessary of all objects are not challenged as the property of individuals nor can any man commit injustice by the most lavish use and enjoyment of these blessings in fertile extensive countries with few inhabitants land is regarded on the same footing and no topic is so much insisted on by those who defend the liberty of the seas as the unexhausted use of them in navigation were the advantages procured by navigation as inexhaustible these reasoners had never any adversaries to refute nor had any claims ever been advanced of a separate exclusive dominion over the ocean it may happen in some countries at some periods that there be established a property in water none in land footnote genesis chapters thirteen and sixteen 
if the latter be in greater abundance than can be used by the inhabitants, and the former be found with difficulty and in very small quantities. Again, suppose that, though the necessities of human race continue the same as at present, yet the mind is so enlarged and so replete with friendship and generosity that every man has the utmost tenderness for every man and feels no more concern for his own interest than for that of his fellows. It seems evident that the use of justice would, in this case, be suspended by such an extensive benevolence. Nor would the divisions and barriers of property and obligation have ever been thought of. Why should I bind another, by a deed or promise, to do me any good office, when I know that he is already prompted, by the strongest inclination, to seek my happiness, and would of himself perform the desired service, except the hurt he thereby receives be greater than the benefit accruing to me? In which case he knows that, from my innate humanity and friendship, I should be the first to oppose myself to his imprudent generosity. Why raise landmarks between my neighbour's field and mine, when my heart has made no division between our interests, but shares all his joys and sorrows with the same force and vivacity as if originally my own? Every man upon this supposition, being a second self to another, would trust all his interests to the discretion of every man, without jealousy, without partition, without distinction and the whole human race would form only one family, where all would lie in common, and be used freely, without regard to property, but cautiously too, with as entire regard to the necessities of each individual, as if our own interests were most intimately concerned. In the present disposition of the human heart, it would, perhaps, be difficult to find complete instances of such enlarged affections, but still we may observe, that the case of families approaches towards it, and the stronger the mutual benevolence is among the individuals, the nearer it approaches, till all distinction of property be, in a great measure, lost and confounded among them. Between married persons, the cement of friendship is by the laws supposed so strong as to abolish all division of possessions, and has often, in reality, the force ascribed to it and it is observable that during the ardour of new enthusiasms when every principle is inflamed into extravagance the community of goods has frequently been attempted and nothing but experience of its inconveniences from the returning or disguised selfishness of men could make the imprudent fanatics adopt anew the ideas of justice and of separate property so true is it that this virtue derives its existence entirely from its necessary use to the intercourse and social state of mankind. To make this truth more evident, let us reverse the foregoing suppositions, and, carrying everything to the opposite extreme, consider what would be the effect of these new situations. Suppose a society to fall into such a want of all common necessaries, that the utmost frugality and industry cannot preserve the greater number from perishing, and the whole from extreme misery. It will readily, I believe, be admitted that the strict laws of justice are suspended in such a pressing emergence, and give place to the stronger motives of necessity and self-preservation. Is it any crime, after a shipwreck, to seize whatever means or instrument of safety one can lay hold of, without regard to former limitations of property? Or, if a city besieged were perishing with hunger, can we imagine that men will see any means of preservation before them, and lose their lives, from a scrupulous regard to what, in other situations, would be the rules of equity and justice? The use and tendency of that virtue is to procure happiness and security by preserving order in society. But where the society is ready to perish from extreme necessity, no greater evil can be dreaded from violence and injustice, and every man may now provide for himself by all the means which prudence can dictate or humanity permit. The public, even in less urgent necessities, opens granaries, without the consent of proprietors, as justly supposing that the authority of magistracy may, consistent with equity, extend so far. But were any number of men to assemble without the tie of laws or civil jurisdiction, would an equal partition of bread in a famine, 
though affected by power and even violence, be regarded as criminal or injurious. Suppose likewise that it should be a virtuous man's fate to fall into the society of ruffians, remote from the protection of laws and government. What conduct must he embrace in that melancholy situation? He sees such a desperate rapaciousness prevail, such a disregard to equity, such contempt of order, such stupid blindness to future consequences, as must immediately have the most tragical conclusion, and must terminate in destruction to the greater number, and in a total dissolution of society to the rest. He, meanwhile, can have no other expedient than to arm himself, to whomever the sword he seizes, or the buckler, may belong, to make provision of all means to defence and security, and his particular regard to justice being no longer of use to his own safety or that of others, he must consult the dictates of self-preservation alone, without concern for those who no longer merit his care and attention. When any man, even in political society, renders himself by his crimes obnoxious to the public, he is punished by the laws in his goods and person, that is, the ordinary rules of justice are, with regard to him, suspended for a moment, and it becomes equitable to inflict on him, for the benefit of society, what otherwise he could not suffer without wrong or injury. The rage and violence of public war. What is it but a suspension of justice among the warring parties, who perceive that this virtue is now no longer of any use or advantage to them? The laws of war which then succeed to those of equity and justice, are rules calculated for the advantage and utility of that particular state in which men are now placed. And were a civilized nation engaged with barbarians, who observed no rules even of war, the former must also suspend their observance of them, where they no longer serve to any purpose, and must render every action or recounter as bloody and pernicious as possible to the first aggressors. Thus the rules of equity or justice depend entirely on the particular state and condition in which men are placed, and owe their origin and existence to that utility, which results to the public from their strict and regular observance. Reverse in any considerable circumstance the condition of men, produce extreme abundance or extreme necessity, implant in the human breast perfect moderation and humanity, or perfect rapaciousness and malice. By rendering justice totally useless, you thereby totally destroy its essence and suspend its obligation upon mankind. The common situation of society is a medium amidst all these extremes. We are naturally partial to ourselves and to our friends, but are capable of learning the advantage resulting from a more equitable conduct. Few enjoyments are given us from the open and liberal hand of nature but by art, labour, and industry, we can extract them in great abundance. Hence the ideas of property become necessary in all civil society. Hence justice derives its usefulness to the public, and hence alone arises its merit and moral obligation. These conclusions are so natural and obvious, that they have not escaped even the poets in their descriptions of the felicity attending the golden age or the reign of Saturn. The seasons, in that first period of nature, were so temperate, if we credit these agreeable fictions, that there was no necessity for men to provide themselves with clothes and houses, as a security against the violence of heat and cold. The rivers flowed with wine and milk, the oaks yielded honey, and nature spontaneously produced her greatest delicacies. Nor were these the chief advantages of that happy age. Tempests were not alone removed from nature, but those more furious tempests were unknown to human breasts, which now cause such uproar and engender such confusion. Avarice, ambition, cruelty, selfishness were never heard of. Cordial affection, compassion, sympathy were the only movements with which the mind was yet acquainted. Even the punctilious distinction of mine and thine was banished from among the happy race of mortals and carried with it the very notion of property and obligation, justice and injustice. The poetical fiction of the Golden Age is, in some respects, of a piece with the philosophical fiction of the state of nature, 
only that the former is represented as the most charming and most peaceable condition which can possibly be imagined, whereas the latter is painted out as a state of mutual war and violence attended with the most extreme necessity. On the first origin of mankind, we are told, their ignorance and savage nature were so prevalent that they could give no mutual trust, but must each depend upon himself and his own force or cunning for protection and security. No law was heard of, no rule of justice known, no distinction of property regarded. Power was the only measure of right, and a perpetual war of all against all was the result of men's untamed selfishness and barbarity. Footnote. This fiction of a state of nature as a state of war was not first started by Mr. Hobbes, as is commonly imagined. Plato endeavours to refute an hypothesis very like it in the second, third and fourth books, De Republica. Cicero, on the contrary, supposes it certain and universally acknowledged in the following passage. Quis enim vestrum, judices, ignorat, ita naturam rerum tulisse, ut cordum tempore homines, nondum neque naturali neque civili jure descripto, fusi per agros ac dispersi vagarentur tantumque haberent quantum manu ac viribus, per caedum ac vulnera, aut eripere aut retinere potuisant, qui igitur primi virtute et concilio prestanti extiterunt, ii per specto genere humanae docilitatis atque ingenii, dissipatus unum in locum congregerunt, eosque ex feritate illa ad justitium ac mansuetudinum transduxerunt. Tum res ad communum utilitatum, quas publicas appellamus, tum conventicula hominum, quae postia civitates nominate sunt. Tum domicilia conjuncta, quas orbes decamus, invento et divino et humano jure monibus sepsurunt, atque inter hanc vitam, per politum humanitate, et illam imanum, nihil tam interest quam jus atque vis. Horum utro uti nolimus, altero est utendum, vim volumus extingui, jus valiet necesse est, idi est, judicia, quibus omne jus continetur, judicia displicent, ant nulla sunt, vis dominator necesse est, haec vident omnes. Pro Sextus, section 42. Whether such a condition of human nature could ever exist, or, if it did, could continue so long as to merit the appellation of a state, may justly be doubted. Men are necessarily born in a family society, at least, and are trained up by their parents to some rule of conduct and behaviour. But this must be admitted that, if such a state of mutual war and violence was ever real, the suspension of all laws of justice from their absolute inutility is a necessary and infallible consequence. The more we vary our views of human life, and the newer and more unusual the lights are in which we survey it, the more shall we be convinced that the origin here assigned for the virtue of justice is real and satisfactory. Were there a species of creatures intermingled with men, which, though rational, were possessed of such inferior strength, both of body and mind, that they were incapable of all resistance, and could never, upon the highest provocation, make us feel the effects of their resentment, the necessary consequence, I think, is that we should be bound by the laws of humanity to give gentle usage to these creatures but should not, properly speaking, lie under any restraint of justice with regard to them. Nor could they possess any right or property exclusive of such arbitrary lords. Our intercourse with them could not be called society, which supposes a degree of equality, but absolute command on the one side and servile obedience on the other. Whatever we covet, they must instantly resign." Our permission is the only tenure by which they hold their possessions, our compassion and kindness the only check by which they curb our lawless will. 
and as no inconvenience ever results from the exercise of a power so firmly established in nature the restraints of justice and property being totally useless would never have place in so unequal a confederacy this is plainly the situation of men with regard to animals and how far these may be said to possess reason i leave it to others to determine the great superiority of civilized europeans above barbarous indians tempted us to imagine ourselves on the same footing with regard to them and made us throw off all restraints of justice and even of humanity in our treatment of them in many nations the female sex are reduced to like slavery and are rendered incapable of all property in opposition to their lordly masters but though the males when united have in all countries bodily force sufficient to maintain this severe tyranny yet such are the insinuation address and charms of their fair companions that women are commonly able to break the confederacy and share with the other sex in all the rights and privileges of society were the human species so framed by nature as that each individual possessed within himself every faculty requisite both for his own preservation and for the propagation of his kind were all society and intercourse cut off between man and man by the primary intention of the supreme creator it seems evident that so solitary a being would be as much incapable of justice as of social discourse and conversation where mutual regards and forbearance serve no manner of purpose they would never direct the conduct of any reasonable man the headlong course of the passions would be checked by no reflection on future consequences and as each man is here supposed to love himself alone and to depend only on himself and his own activity for safety and happiness he would on every occasion to the utmost of his power challenge the preference above every other being to none of which he is bound by any ties either of nature or of interest but suppose the conjunction of the sexes to be established in nature a family immediately arises and particular rules being found requisite for its subsistence these are immediately embraced though without comprehending the rest of mankind within their prescriptions suppose that several families unite together into one society which is totally disjoined from all others the rules which preserve peace and order enlarge themselves to the utmost extent of that society but becoming then entirely useless lose their force when carried one step farther but again suppose that several distinct societies maintain a kind of intercourse for mutual convenience and advantage the boundaries of justice still grow larger in proportion to the largeness of men's views and the force of their mutual connections history experience reason sufficiently instruct us in this natural progress of human sentiments and in the gradual enlargement of our regards to justice in proportion as we become acquainted with the extensive utility of that virtue end of section number four Section 5 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume. Section 3 of Justice, Part 2 if we examine the particular laws by which justice is directed and property determined we shall still be presented with the same conclusion the good of mankind is the only object of all these laws and regulations not only is it requisite for the peace and interest of society that men's possessions should be separated but the rules which we follow in making the separation are such as can best be contrived to serve farther the interests of society we shall suppose that a creature possessed of reason but unacquainted with human nature deliberates with himself what rules of justice or property would best promote public interest and establish peace and security among mankind his most obvious thought would be to assign the largest possessions to the most extensive virtue and give every one the power of doing good proportioned to his inclination in a perfect theocracy 
where a being infinitely intelligent governs by particular volitions this rule would certainly have place and might serve to the wisest purposes but were mankind to execute such a law so great is the uncertainty of merit both from its natural obscurity and from the self-conceit of each individual that no determinate rule of conduct would ever result from it and the total dissolution of society must be the immediate consequence fanatics may suppose that dominion is founded on grace and that saints alone inherit the earth but the civil magistrate very justly puts these sublime theorists on the same footing with common robbers and teaches them by the severest discipline that a rule which in speculation may seem the most advantageous to society may yet be found in practice totally pernicious and destructive that there were religious fanatics of this kind in england during the civil wars we learn from history though it is probable that the obvious tendency of these principles excited such horror in mankind as soon obliged the dangerous enthusiasts to renounce or at least conceal their tenets perhaps the levellers who claimed an equal distribution of property were a kind of political fanatics which arose from the religious species and more openly avowed their pretensions as carrying a more plausible appearance of being practicable in themselves as well as useful to human society it must indeed be confessed that nature is so liberal to mankind that were all her presence equally divided among the species and improved by art and industry every individual would enjoy all the necessities and even most of the comforts of life nor would ever be liable to any ills but such as might accidentally arise from the sickly frame and constitution of his body it must also be confessed that wherever we depart from this equality we rob the poor of more satisfaction than we add to the rich and the slight gratification of a frivolous vanity in one individual frequently costs more than bread to many families and even provinces it may appear withal that the rule of equality as it would be highly useful and not altogether impracticable but has taken place at least in an imperfect degree in some republics particularly that of sparta where it was attended it is said with the most beneficial consequences not to mention that the agrarian laws so frequently claimed in rome and carried into execution in many greek cities proceeded all of them from a general idea of the utility of this principle but historians and even common sense may inform us that however specious these ideas of perfect equality may seem they are really at bottom impractical and were they not so would be extremely pernicious to human society render possessions ever so equal men's different degrees of art care and industry will immediately break that equality or if you check these virtues you reduce society the most extreme indigence and instead of preventing want and beggary in a few render it unavoidable to the whole community the most rigorous inquisition too is requisite to watch every inequality on its first appearance and the most severe jurisdiction to punish and redress it but besides that so much authority must soon degenerate into tyranny and be exerted with great partialities who can possibly be possessed of it in such a situation as is here supposed perfect equality of possessions destroying all subordination weakens extremely the authority of magistracy and must reduce all power nearly to a level as well as property we may conclude therefore that in order to establish laws for the regulation of property we must be acquainted with the nature and situation of man must reject appearances which may be false though specious and must search for those rules which are on the whole most useful and beneficial vulgar sense and slight experience are sufficient for this purpose where men give not way to too selfish avidity or too extensive enthusiasm who sees not for instance that whatever is produced or improved by a man's art or industry ought for ever to be secured to him in order to give encouragement to such useful habits and accomplishments 
that the property ought also to descend to children and relations, for the same useful purpose. That it may be alienated by consent, in order to beget that commerce and intercourse which is so beneficial to human society, and that all contracts and promises ought carefully to be fulfilled, in order to secure mutual trust and confidence, by which the general interest of mankind is so much promoted. Examine the writers on the laws of nature, and you will always find that, whatever principles they set out with, they are sure to terminate here at last, and to assign as the ultimate reason for every rule which they establish the convenience and necessities of mankind. A concession thus extorted, in opposition to systems, has more authority than if it had been made in prosecution of them. What other reason, indeed, could writers ever give, why this must be mine and that yours, since uninstructed nature surely never made any such distinction? The objects which receive those appellations are, of themselves, foreign to us. They are totally disjointed and separated from us, and nothing but the general interests of society can form the connection. Sometimes the interests of society may require a rule of justice in a particular case, but may not determine any particular rule among several which are all equally beneficial. In that case, the slightest analogies are laid hold of, in order to prevent that indifference and ambiguity which would be the source of perpetual dissension. Thus possession alone, and first possession, is supposed to convey property, where no body else has any preceding claim and pretension. Many of the reasonings of lawyers are of this analogical nature, and depend on very slight connections of the imagination. Does any one scruple, in extraordinary cases, to violate all regard to the private property of individuals, and sacrifice to public interest a distinction which had been established for the sake of that interest? The safety of the people is the supreme law. All other particular laws are subordinate to it, and dependent on it, and if, in the common course of things, they be followed and regarded, it is only because the public safety and interest commonly demand so equal and impartial an administration. Sometimes both utility and analogy fail, and leave the laws of justice in total uncertainty. Thus, it is highly requisite that prescription or long possession should convey property. But what number of days or months or years should be sufficient for that purpose, it is impossible for reason alone to determine. Civil laws here supply the place of the natural code, and assign different terms for prescription, according to the different utilities proposed by the legislator. Bills of exchange and promissory notes, by the laws of most countries, prescribe sooner than bonds and mortgages, and contracts of a more formal nature. In general, we may observe that all questions of property are subordinate to the authority of civil laws, which extend, restrain, modify, and alter the rules of natural justice, according to the particular convenience of each community. The laws have, or ought to have, a constant reference to the constitution of government, the manners, the climate, the religion, the commerce, the situation of each society. A late author of genius, as well as learning, has prosecuted this subject at large, and has established from these principles a system of political knowledge which abounds in ingenious and brilliant thoughts, and is not wanting in solidity. Footnote the author of L'Esprit des Lois. This illustrious writer, however, sets out with a different theory, and supposes all right to be founded on certain rapport, or relations, which is a system that, in my opinion, never will be reconciled with true philosophy. Father Malebranche, as far as I can learn, was the first that started this abstract theory of morals, which was afterwards adopted by Cudworth, Clark, and others, and as it excludes all sentiment, and pretends to found everything on reason, it has not wanted followers in this philosophic age. See section 1, appendix 1. With regard to justice, the virtue here treated of, the inference against this theory seems short and conclusive. Property is allowed to be dependent on civil laws. Civil laws are allowed to have no other object but the interest of society. 
This, therefore, must be allowed to be the sole foundation of property and justice. Not to mention that our obligation itself to obey the magistrate and his laws is founded on nothing but the interests of society. If the ideas of justice, sometimes, do not follow the dispositions of civil law, we shall find that these cases, instead of objections, are confirmations of the theory delivered above. Where a civil law is so perverse as to cross all interests of society, it loses all its authority, and men judge by the ideas of natural justice which are conformable to those interests. Sometimes also civil laws, for useful purposes, require a ceremony or form to any deed, and where that is wanting, their decrees run contrary to the usual tenor of justice. But one who takes advantage of such chicanes is not commonly regarded as an honest man. Thus the interests of society require that contracts be fulfilled, and there is not a more material article either of natural or civil justice. But the omission of a trifling circumstance will often, by law, invalidate a contract, in foro humano, but not in foro conscientiae, as divines express themselves. In these cases, the magistrate is supposed only to withdraw his power of enforcing the right, not to have altered the right. Where his intention extends to the right, and is conformable to the interests of society, it never fails to alter the right, a clear proof of the origin of justice and of property as assigned above. What is a man's property? Anything which is lawful for him and for him alone to use. But what rule have we by which we can distinguish these objects? Here we must have recourse to statutes, customs, precedents, analogies, and a hundred other circumstances, some of which are constant and inflexible, some variable and arbitrary. But the ultimate point in which they all professedly terminate is the interest and happiness of human society. Where this enters not into consideration, nothing can appear more whimsical, unnatural, and even superstitious than all or most of the laws of justice and property. Those who ridicule vulgar superstitions, and expose the folly of particular regards to meats, days, places, postures, apparel, have an easy task, while they consider all the qualities and relations of the objects, and discover no adequate cause for that affection or antipathy, veneration or horror, which have so mighty an influence over a considerable part of mankind. A Syrian would have starved rather than taste pigeon. An Egyptian would not have approached bacon. But if these species of food be examined by the senses of sight, smell, or taste, or scrutinized by the sciences of chemistry, medicine, or physics, no difference is ever found between them and any other species, nor can that precise circumstance be pitched on which may afford a just foundation for the religious passion. A fowl on Thursday is lawful food. On Friday, abominable. Eggs in this house and in this diocese are permitted during Lent. A hundred paces farther, to eat them is a damnable sin. This earth or building yesterday was profane. Today, by the muttering of certain words, it has become holy and sacred. Such reflections as these, in the mouth of a philosopher, one may safely say, are too obvious to have any influence because they must always, to every man, occur at first sight, and where they prevail not, of themselves, they are surely obstructed by education, prejudice, and passion, not by ignorance or mistake. It may appear to a careless view, or rather a too abstracted reflection, that there enters a like superstition into all the sentiments of justice, and that, if a man expose its object, or what we call property, to the same scrutiny of sense and science, he will not, by the most accurate inquiry, find any foundation for the same difference made by moral sentiment. I may lawfully nourish myself from this tree, but the fruit of another of the same species, ten paces off, it is criminal for me to touch. Had I worn this apparel an hour ago, I had merited the severest punishment." 
but a man, by pronouncing a few magical syllables, has now rendered it fit for my use and service. Were this house placed in the neighbouring territory, it had been immoral for me to dwell in it, but being built on this side of the river it is subject to a different municipal law, and by its becoming mine I incur no blame or censure. The same species of reasoning, it may be thought, which so successfully exposes superstition, is also applicable to justice. Nor is it possible, in the one case more than in the other, to point out, in the object, that precise quality or circumstance which is the foundation of the sentiment. But there is this material difference between superstition and justice, that the former is frivolous, useless, and burdensome. The latter is absolutely requisite to the well-being of mankind and existence of society. When we abstract from this circumstance, for it is too apparent ever to be overlooked, it must be confessed that all regards to right and property seem entirely without foundation as much as the grossest and most vulgar superstition. Were the interests of society no wise concerned, it is as unintelligible why another's articulating certain sounds implying consent should change the nature of my actions with regard to a particular object, as why the reciting of a liturgy by the priest in a certain habit and posture should dedicate a heap of brick and timber and render it, thenceforth and for ever, sacred. Footnote. It is evident that the will or consent alone never transfers property, nor causes the obligation of a promise, for the same reasoning extends to both, but the will must be expressed by words or signs in order to impose a tie upon any man. The expression being once brought in as subservient to the will soon becomes the principal part of the promise, nor will a man be less bound by his word, though he secretly gives a different direction to his intention and withhold the assent of his mind. But though the expression makes, on most occasions, the whole of the promise, yet it does not always so, and one who should make use of any expression of which he knows not the meaning, and which he uses without any sense of the consequences, would not certainly be bound by it. Nay, though he know its meaning, yet if he use it in jest only, and with such signs as evidently show that he has no serious intention of binding himself, he would not lie under any obligation of performance. But it is necessary that the words be a perfect expression of the will, without any contrary signs. Nay, even this we must not carry so far as to imagine that one whom, by our quickness of understanding, we conjecture from certain signs to have an intention of deceiving us, is not bound by his expression or verbal promise if we accept of it, but must limit this conclusion to those cases where the signs are of a different nature from those of deceit. All these contradictions are easily accounted for if justice arise entirely from its usefulness to society, but will never be explained on any other hypothesis. It is remarkable that the moral decisions of the Jesuits and other relaxed casuists were commonly formed in prosecution of some such subtleties of reasoning as are here pointed out and proceed as much from the habit of scholastic refinement as from any corruption of the heart, if we may follow the authority of Monsignor Bale. See his dictionary, article Loyola. And why has the indignation of mankind risen so high against these casuists? But because every one perceived that human society could not subsist were such practices authorized, and that morals must always be handled with a view to public interest more than philosophical regularity. If the secret direction of the intention, said every man of sense, could invalidate a contract, where is our security? and yet a metaphysical schoolman might think that where an intention was supposed to be requisite if that intention really had not place no consequence ought to follow and no obligation be imposed the casuistical subtleties may not be greater than the subtleties of lawyers hinted at above but as the former are pernicious and the latter innocent and even necessary this is the reason of the very different reception they meet with from the world. 
it is a doctrine of the church of rome that a priest by a secret direction of his intention can invalidate any sacrament this position is derived from a strict and regular prosecution of the obvious truth that empty words alone without any meaning or intention in the speaker can never be attended with any effect if the same conclusion be not admitted in reasonings concerning civil contracts where the affair is allowed to be of so much less consequence than the eternal salvation of thousands it proceeds entirely from men's sense of the danger and inconvenience of the doctrine in the former case and we may thence observe that however positive arrogant and dogmatical any superstition may appear it never can convey any thorough persuasion of the reality of its objects or put them in any degree on a balance with the common incidents of life which we learn from daily observation and experimental reasoning End of footnote. these reflections are far from weakening the obligations of justice or diminishing anything from the most sacred attention to property on the contrary such sentiments must acquire new force from the present reasoning for what stronger foundation can be desired or conceived for any duty than to observe that human society or even human nature could not subsist without the establishment of it and will still arrive at greater degrees of happiness and perfection the more inviolable the regard is which is paid to that duty the dilemma seems obvious as justice evidently tends to promote public utility and to support civil society the sentiment of justice is either derived from our reflecting on that tendency or like hunger thirst and other appetites resentment love of life attachment to offspring and other passions arise from a simple original instinct in the human breast which nature has implanted for like salutary purposes if the latter be the case it follows that property which is the object of justice is also distinguished by a simple original instinct and is not ascertained by any argument or reflection but who is there that ever heard of such an instinct or is this a subject in which new discoveries can be made we may as well expect to discover in the body new senses which had before escaped the observation of all mankind but farther, though it seems a very simple proposition to say that nature, by an instinctive sentiment, distinguishes property, yet in reality we shall find that there are required for that purpose ten thousand different instincts, and these employed about objects of the greatest intricacy and nicest discernment. For when a definition of property is required, that relation is found to resolve itself into any possession acquired by occupation, by industry, by prescription, by inheritance, by contract, etc. Can we think that nature, by an original instinct, instructs us in all these methods of acquisition? These words, too, inheritance and contract, stand for ideas infinitely complicated, and to define them exactly, a hundred volumes of laws and a thousand volumes of commentators have not been found sufficient. Does nature, whose instincts in men are all simple, embrace such complicated and artificial objects and create a rational creature without trusting anything to the operation of his reason? But even though all this were admitted, it would not be satisfactory. Positive laws can certainly transfer property. It is by another original instinct that we recognize the authority of kings and senates, and mark all the boundaries of their jurisdiction. Judges, too, even though their sentences be erroneous and illegal, must be allowed, for the sake of peace and order, to have decisive authority and ultimately to determine property. Have we original innate ideas of praetors and chancellors and juries? Who sees not that all these institutions arise merely from the necessities of human society? All birds of the same species, in every age and country, build their nests alike. In this we see the force of instinct. Men, in different times and places, frame their houses differently. Here we perceive the influence of reason and custom. A like influence may be drawn from comparing the instinct of generation and the institution of property. How great soever the variety of municipal laws, it must be confessed that their chief outlines pretty regularly concur, 
because the purposes to which they tend are everywhere exactly similar. In like manner, all houses have a roof and walls, windows and chimneys, though diversified in their shape, figure and materials. The purposes of the latter, directed to the conveniences of human life, discover not more plainly their origin from reason and reflection than do those of the former, which point all to a like end. I need not mention the variations which all the rules of property receive from the finer turns and connections of the imagination, and from the subtleties and abstractions of law topics and reasonings. There is no possibility of reconciling this observation to the notion of original instincts. What alone will beget a doubt concerning the theory, on which I insist is the influence of education and acquired habits, by which we are so accustomed to blame injustice, that we are not, in every instance, conscious of any immediate reflection on the pernicious consequences of it. The views the most familiar to us are apt, for that very reason, to escape us, and what we have very frequently performed from certain motives, we are apt likewise to continue mechanically, without recalling, on every occasion, the reflections which first determined us. The convenience, or rather necessity, which leads to justice is so universal, and everywhere points so much to the same rules, that the habit takes place in all societies, and it is not without some scrutiny that we are able to ascertain its true origin. The matter, however, is not so obscure, but that even in common life we have every moment recourse to the principle of public utility, and ask, what must become of the world if such practices prevail? How could society subsist under such disorders? Were the distinction or separation of possessions entirely useless, can any one conceive that it ever should have obtained in society? Thus we seem, upon the whole, to have attained a knowledge of the force of that principle here insisted on, and can determine what degree of esteem or moral approbation may result from reflections on public interest and utility. The necessity of justice to the support of society is the sole foundation of that virtue, and since no moral excellence is more highly esteemed, we may conclude that this circumstance of usefulness has, in general, the strongest energy, and most entire command over our sentiments. It must, therefore, be the source of a considerable part of the merit ascribed to humanity, benevolence, friendship, public spirit and other social virtues of that stamp, as it is the sole source of the moral approbation paid to fidelity, justice, veracity, integrity, and those other estimable and useful qualities and principles. It is entirely agreeable to the rules of philosophy, and even of common reason, where any principle has been found to have a great force and energy in one instance, to ascribe to it a like energy in all similar instances. This, indeed, is Newton's chief rule of philosophizing. Footnote. Principia. Liber. Tertium. End of section 5. Section 6 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glenn Chadler. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume. Section 4 of Political Society. Had every man sufficient sagacity to perceive at all times the strong interest which binds him to the observance of justice and equity, and strength of mind sufficient to persevere in a steady adherence to a general and a distant interest, in opposition to the allurements of present pleasure and advantage, there had never in that case been any such thing as government or political society, but each man, following his natural liberty, had lived in entire peace and harmony with all others. What need of positive law where natural justice is, of itself, a sufficient restraint? Why create magistrates where there never arises any disorder or iniquity? Why abridge our native freedom when, in every instance, the utmost exertion of it is found innocent and beneficial? Is it evident that, if government were totally useless, it never could have place, 
and that the sole foundation of the duty of allegiance is the advantage which it procures to society by preserving peace and order among mankind when a number of political societies are erected and maintain a great intercourse together a new set of rules are immediately discovered to be useful in that particular situation and accordingly take place under the title of laws of nations of this kind are the sacredness of the persons of ambassadors abstaining from poisoned arms quarter in war with others of that kind which are plainly calculated for the advantage of states and kingdoms in their intercourse with each other the rules of justice such as prevail among individuals are not entirely suspended among political societies all princes pretend a regard to the rights of other princes and some no doubt without hypocrisy alliances and treaties are every day made between independent states which would only be so much of a waste of parchment if they were not found by experience to have some influence and authority but here is the difference between kingdoms and individuals human nature cannot by any means subsist without the association of individuals and that association never could have place were no regard paid to the laws of equity and justice disorder confusion the war of all against all are necessary consequences of such licentious conduct but nations can subsist without intercourse they may even subsist in some degree under a general war the observance of justice though useful among them is not guarded by so strong a necessity as among individuals and the moral obligation holds proportion with the usefulness all politicians will allow and most philosophers that the reasons of state may in particular emergencies dispense with the rules of justice and invalidate any treaty or alliance where the strict observance of it would be prejudicial in a considerable degree to either of the contracting parties but nothing less than the most extreme necessity it is confessed can justify individuals in a breach of promise or an invasion of the properties of others in a confederated commonwealth such as the Achaean republic of old or the swiss cantons and united provinces in modern times as the league here has a peculiar utility the conditions of union have a peculiar sacredness and authority and a violation of them would be regarded as no less or even as more criminal than any private injury or injustice the long and hapless infancy of man requires the combination of parents for the subsistence of their young and that combination requires the virtue of chastity or fidelity to the marriage bed without such a utility it will readily be owned that such a virtue would never have been thought of an infidelity of this nature is much more pernicious in women than in men hence the laws of chastity are much stricter over one sex than over the other these rules have all a reference to generation and yet women past childbearing are no more supposed to be exempt from them than those in the flower of their youth and beauty general rules are often extended beyond principles whence they first arise and this in all matters of taste and sentiment it is a vulgar story at paris that during the rage of the mississippi a humpback fellow went every day into the rue de quincemopois where the stock jobbers met in great crowds and was well paid for allowing them to make use of his hump as a desk in order to sign their contracts upon it would the fortune which he raised by this expedient make him a handsome fellow though it be confessed that personal beauty arises very much from the ideas of utility the imagination is influenced by associations of ideas which though they arise at first from the judgments are not easily altered by every particular exception that occurs to us to which we may add in the present case of chastity that the example of the old would be pernicious to the young and that women continually foreseeing that a certain time would bring them the liberty of indulgence would naturally advance that period and think more lightly of this whole duty so requisite to society those who live in the same family have such frequent opportunities of license of this kind that nothing could prevent purity of manners or marriage allowed among the nearest relations or any intercourse of love between them ratified by law and custom incest therefore being pernicious in a superior degree has also a superior turpitude and moral deformity annexed to it what is the reason why by the athenian laws one might marry a half-sister by the father but not by the mother plainly this 
the manners of the athenians were so reserved that a man was never permitted to approach the woman's apartment even in the same family unless who he visited was his own mother his stepmother and her children were as much shut up from him as the woman of any other family and there was as little danger of any criminal correspondence between them uncles and nieces for a like reason might marry at athens but neither these nor half-brothers and sisters could contract that alliance at rome where the intercourse was more open between the sexes public utility is the cause of all these variations to repeat to a man's prejudice anything that escaped him in private conversation or to make any such use of his private letters is highly blamed the free and social intercourse of minds must be extremely checked where no such rules of fidelity are established even in repeating stories whence we can foresee no ill consequence to result the giving of one's author is regarded as a piece of indiscretion if not of immorality these stories in passing from hand to hand and receiving all the usual variations frequently come about to the persons concerned and produce animosities and quarrels among people whose intentions are the most innocent and inoffensive to pry into secrets to open or even read the letters of others to play the spy upon their words and looks and actions what habits more inconvenient society what habits of consequence more blamable this principle is also the foundation of most of the laws of good manners a kind of lesser morality calculated for the ease of company and conversation too much or too little ceremony are both blamed and everything which promotes ease without an indecent familiarity is useful and laudable constancy in friendships attachments and familiarities is commendable and is requisite to support trust and good correspondence in society but the places of general though causal concourse where the pursuit of health and pleasure brings people promiscuously together public conveniency has dispensed with this maxim and custom there promotes an unreserved conversation for the time by indulging the privilege of dropping afterwards every indifferent acquaintance without breach of civility or good manners even in societies which are established on principles the most immoral and the most destructive to the interests of the general society there are required certain rules which a species of false honor as well as private interest engages the members to observe robbers and pirates it has often been remarked could not maintain their pernicious confederacy did they not establish a pew distributive justice among themselves and recall those laws of equity which they have violated along with the rest of mankind i hate a drinking companion says the greek proverb who never forgets the follies of the last debauch should be buried in eternal oblivion in order to give full scope to the follies of the next among nations where an immoral gallantry if covered with a thin veil of mystery is in some degree authorized by custom there immediately arises a set of rules calculated for the conveniency of that attachment the famous court or parliament of love in province formally decided all difficult cases of this nature in societies for play there are laws required for the conduct of the game and these laws are different in each game the foundation i own of such societies is frivolous and the laws are in great measure though not altogether capricious and arbitrary so far is there a material difference between them and the rules of justice fidelity and loyalty the general societies of men are absolutely requisite for the subsistence of the species and the public conveniency which regulates morals is inviolably established in the nature of men and of the world in which he lives the comparison therefore in these respects is imperfect we may only learn from it the necessity of rules wherever men have any intercourse with each other they cannot even pass each other on the road without rules wagoners coachmen and postilions have principles by which they give the way and these are chiefly founded on mutual ease and convenience sometimes also they are arbitrary at least dependent on a kind of capricious analogy like many of those reasonings of lawyers footnote that the lighter machine yield to the heavier and in machines of the same kind that the empty yield to the loaded this rule is founded on convenience that those who are going to the capital take place of those who are coming from it this seems to be founded on some idea of dignity of the great city and of the preference of the future to the past 
from like reasons among footwalkers the right-handed entitles a man to the wall and prevents jostling which peaceable people find very disagreeable and inconvenient and footnote to carry the matter farther we may observe that it is impossible for men so much as to murder each other without statutes and maxims and an idea of justice and honor war has its laws as well as peace and even that sportive kind of war carried on among wrestlers boxers cudgel players gladiators is regulated by fixed principles common interest and utility beget infallibly a standard of right and wrong among the parties concerned end of section six of political societies recording by glenn Schuyler, randolph new jersey section seven of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. an inquiry concerning the principles of morals by david hume section five why utility pleases part one it seems so natural a thought to ascribe to their utility the praise which we bestow on the social virtues, that one would expect to meet with this principle everywhere in the moral writers, as the chief foundation of their reasoning and inquiry. In common life we may observe that the circumstance of utility is always appealed to, nor is it supposed that a greater eulogy can be given to any man than to display his usefulness to the public and enumerate the services which he has performed to mankind and society. What praise, even of an inanimate form, if the regularity and elegance of its parts destroy not its fitness for any useful purpose? And how satisfactory an apology for any disproportion or seeming deformity, if we can show the necessity of that particular construction for the use intended? A ship appears more beautiful to an artist or one moderately skilled in navigation, where its prow is wide and swelling beyond its poop, than if it were framed with a precise geometrical regularity, in contradiction to all the laws of mechanics. A building, whose doors and windows were exact squares, would hurt the eye by that very proportion, as ill-adapted to the figure of a human creature, for whose service the fabric was intended. What wonder, then, that a man, whose habits and conduct are hurtful to society, and dangerous or pernicious to every one who has an intercourse with him, should, on that account, be an object of disapprobation, and communicate to every spectator the strongest sentiment of disgust and hatred. Footnote. We ought not to imagine, because an inanimate object may be useful as well as a man, that, therefore, it ought also, according to this system, to merit the appellation of virtuous. The sentiments, excited by utility, are in the two cases very different, and the one is mixed with affection, esteem, approbation, etc., and not the other. In like manner, an inanimate object may have good colour and proportions, as well as a human figure, but can we ever be in love with the former? There are a numerous set of passions and sentiments, of which thinking rational beings are, by the original constitution of nature, the only proper objects. And though the very same qualities be transferred to an insensible, inanimate being, they will not excite the same sentiments. The beneficial qualities of herbs and minerals are indeed sometimes called their virtues, but this is an effect of the caprice of language, which ought not to be regarded in reasoning. For though there be a species of approbation attending even inanimate objects, when beneficial, yet this sentiment is so weak, and so different from that which is directed to beneficent magistrates or statesmen, that they ought not to be ranked under the same class or appellation. A very small variation of the object, even where the same qualities are preserved, will destroy a sentiment. Thus the same beauty transferred to a different sex excites no amorous passion, where nature is not extremely perverted. End of footnote. But perhaps the difficulty of accounting for these effects of usefulness, or its contrary, has kept philosophers from admitting them into their systems of ethics, and has induced them rather to employ any other principle in explaining the origin of moral good and evil. 
But it is no just reason for rejecting any principle, confirmed by experience, that we cannot give a satisfactory account of its origin, nor are able to resolve it into other more general principles. And if we would employ a little thought on the present subject, we need be at no loss to account for the influence of utility, and to deduce it from principles the most known and avowed in human nature. From the apparent usefulness of the social virtues, it has readily been inferred by the sceptics, both ancient and modern, that all moral distinctions arise from education, and were at first invented and afterwards encouraged by the art of the politicians, in order to render men tractable, and subdue their natural ferocity and selfishness, which incapacitated them for society. This principle, indeed, of precept and education, must so far be owned to have a powerful influence, that it may frequently increase or diminish, beyond their natural standard, the sentiments of approbation or dislike, and may even, in particular instances, create without any natural principle a new sentiment of this kind, as is evident in all superstitious practices and observances. But that all moral affection or dislike arises from this origin will never surely be allowed by any judicious inquirer. Had nature made no such distinction, founded on the original constitution of the mind, the words honourable and shameful, lovely and odious, noble and despicable, had never had place in any language. Nor could politicians, had they invented these terms, ever have been able to render them intelligible, or make them convey any idea to the audience. So that nothing can be more superficial than this paradox of the sceptics. And it were well, if, in the abstruser studies of logic and metaphysics, we could as easily obviate the cavils of that sect, as in the practical and more intelligible sciences of politics and morals. The social virtues must, therefore, be allowed to have a natural beauty and amiableness, which, at first, antecedent to all precept or education, recommends them to the esteem of uninstructed mankind, and engages their affections. And as the public utility of these virtues is the chief circumstance whence they derive their merit, it follows that the end, which they have a tendency to promote, must be some way agreeable to us, and take hold of some natural affection. It must please, either from considerations of self-interest, or from more generous motives and regards. It has often been asserted that, as every man has a strong connection with society, and perceives the impossibility of his solitary subsistence, he becomes, on that account, favourable to all those habits or principles which promote order in society, and ensure to him the quiet possession of so inestimable a blessing. As much as we value our own happiness and welfare, as much must we applaud the practice of justice and humanity, by which alone the social confederacy can be maintained, and every man reap the fruits of mutual protection and assistance. This deduction of morals from self-love, or a regard to private interest, is an obvious thought, and has not arisen wholly from the wanton sallies and sportive assaults of the sceptics. To mention no others, Polybius, one of the gravest and most judicious, as well as the most moral writers of antiquity, has assigned this selfish origin to all our sentiments of virtue. But though the solid practical sense of that author, and his aversion to all vain subtleties, render his authority on the present subject very considerable, yet is not this an affair to be decided by authority, and the voice of nature and experience seems plainly to oppose the selfish theory. We frequently bestow praise on virtuous actions performed in very distant ages and remote countries, where the utmost subtlety of imagination would not discover any appearance of self-interest, or find any connection of our present happiness and security with events so widely separated from us. A generous, a brave, a noble deed, performed by an adversary, commands our approbation, while in its consequences it may be acknowledged prejudicial to our particular interest. Where private advantage concurs with general affection for virtue, we readily perceive and avow the mixture of these distinct sentiments, which have a very different feeling and influence on the mind. We praise, perhaps, with more alacrity, where the generous humane action contributes to our particular interest. But the topics of praise, which we insist on, are very wide of this circumstance. 
and we may attempt to bring over others to our sentiments, without endeavouring to convince them that they reap any advantage from the actions which we recommend to their approbation and applause. Frame the model of a praiseworthy character, consisting of all the most amiable moral virtues. Give instances in which these display themselves after an eminent and extraordinary manner. You readily engage the esteem and approbation of all your audience, who never so much inquire in what age and country the person lived who possessed these noble qualities, a circumstance, however, of all the others, the most material to self-love, or a concern for our own individual happiness. Once on a time, a statesman, in the shock and contest of parties, prevailed so far as to procure, by his eloquence, the banishment of an able adversary, whom he secretly followed, offering him money for his support during his exile, and soothing him with the topics of consolation in his misfortunes. Alas, cries the banished statesman, with what regret must I leave my friends in this city, where even enemies are so generous? Virtue, though in an enemy, here pleased him, and we also give it the just tribute of praise and approbation. Nor do we retract these sentiments when we hear that the action passed at Athens about two thousand years ago, and that the person's names were Eschines and Demosthenes. What is that to me? There are very few occasions when this question is not pertinent, and had it that universal infallible influence supposed, it would turn into ridicule every composition, and almost every conversation, which contain any praise or censure of men and manners. It is but a weak subterfuge, when pressed by these facts and arguments, to say that we transport ourselves by the force of the imagination into distant ages and countries, and consider the advantage which we should have reaped from these characters had we been contemporaries, and had any commerce with the persons. It is not conceivable how a real sentiment or passion can ever arise from a known imaginary interest, especially when our real interest is still kept in view, and is often acknowledged to be entirely distinct from the imaginary, and even sometimes opposite to it. A man, brought to the brink of a precipice, cannot look down without trembling, and the sentiment of imaginary danger actuates him in opposition to the opinion and belief of real safety. But the imagination is here assisted by the presence of a striking object, and yet prevails not, except it be also aided by novelty, and the unusual appearance of the object. Custom soon reconciles us to heights and precipices, and wears off these false and delusive terrors. The reverse is observable in the estimates which we form of characters and manners, and the more we habituate ourselves to an accurate scrutiny of morals, the more delicate feeling do we acquire of the most minute distinctions between vice and virtue. Such frequent occasion, indeed, have we in common life to pronounce all kinds of moral determinations, that no object of this kind can be new or unusual to us, nor could any false view or presuppositions maintain their ground against an experience so common and familiar. Experience being chiefly what forms the association of ideas, it is impossible that any association could establish and support itself in direct opposition to that principle. Usefulness is agreeable, and engages our approbation. This is a matter of fact, confirmed by daily observation. But useful? For what? For somebody's interest, surely. Whose interest, then? Not our own only, for our approbation frequently extends farther. It must, therefore, be the interest of those who are served by the character or action approved of, and these, we may conclude, however remote, are not totally indifferent to us. By opening up this principle, we shall discover one great source of moral distinctions. End of section 7. Recording by Lucas Balding. Section 8 of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume. Section 5. Why Utility Pleases. Part 2. Self-love is a principle in human nature of such extensive energy and the interest of each individual is, in general, so closely connected with that of the community, 
that those philosophers were excusable who fancied that all our concern for the public might be resolved into a concern for our own happiness and preservation. They saw every moment instances of approbation or blame, satisfaction or displeasure towards characters and actions. They denominated the objects of these sentiments virtues or vices. They observed that the former had a tendency to increase the happiness and the latter the misery of mankind. They asked whether it were possible that we could have any general concern for society, or any disinterested resentment of the welfare or injury of others. They found it simpler to consider all these sentiments as modifications of self-love, and they discovered a pretense, at least, for this union of principle, in that close union of interest which is so observable between the public and each individual. But notwithstanding this frequent confusion of interests, it is easy to attain what natural philosophers, after Lord Bacon, have affected to call the experimentum crucis, or that experiment which points out the right way in any doubt or ambiguity. We have found instances in which private interest was separate from public, in which it was even contrary, and yet we observed the moral sentiment to continue notwithstanding this disjunction of interests, and wherever these distinct interests sensibly concurred, we always found a sensible increase of the sentiment, and a more warm affection to virtue, and a detestation of vice, or what we probably call gratitude and revenge. Compelled by these instances, we must renounce the theory which accounts for every moral sentiment by the principle of self-love. We must adopt a more public affection, and allow that the interests of society are not, even on their own account, entirely indifferent to us. Usefulness is only a tendency to a certain end, and it is a contradiction in terms that anything pleases as a means to an end where the end itself nowise affects us. If usefulness, therefore, be a source of moral sentiment, and if this usefulness be not always considered with a reference to self, it follows that everything which contributes to the happiness of society recommends itself directly to our approbation and goodwill. Here is a principle which accounts in great part for the origin of morality. And what need we seek for abstruse and remote systems when there occurs one so obvious and natural? Footnote. It is needless to push our researches so far as to ask why we have humanity or fellow feeling with others. It is sufficient that this is experienced to be a principle in human nature. We must stop somewhere in our examination of causes, and there are in every science some general principles beyond which we cannot hope to find any principle more general. No man is absolutely indifferent to the happiness and misery of others. The first has a natural tendency to give pleasure, the second pain. This every one may find in himself. It is not probable that these principles can be resolved into principles more simple and universal, whatever attempts may have been made to that purpose. But if it were possible, it belongs not to the present subject, and we may here safely consider these principles as original, happy if we can render all the consequences sufficiently plain and perspicuous. End of footnote. Have we any difficulty to comprehend the force of humanity and benevolence, or to conceive that the very aspect of happiness, joy, prosperity, gives pleasure, that of pain, suffering, sorrow, communicates uneasiness? The human countenance, says Horace, borrows smiles or tears from the human countenance. Reduce a person to solitude, and he loses all enjoyment except either of the sensual or speculative kind, and that because the movements of his heart are not forwarded by correspondent movements in his fellow creatures. The signs of sorrow and mourning, though arbitrary, affect us with melancholy, but the natural symptoms, tears and cries and groans, never fail to infuse compassion and uneasiness. And if the effects of misery touch us in so lively a manner, can we be supposed altogether insensible or indifferent towards its causes, when a malicious or treacherous character and behaviour are presented to us? We enter, I shall suppose, into a convenient, warm, well-contrived apartment. We necessarily receive a pleasure from its very survey, because it presents us with the pleasing ideas of ease, satisfaction, and enjoyment. The hospitable, good-humoured, humane landlord appears. This circumstance must surely embellish the whole, nor can we easily forbear reflecting, with pleasure, on the satisfaction which results to everyone from his intercourse and good offices. His whole family, by the freedom, ease, confidence, and calm enjoyment diffused over their countenances, 
sufficiently express their happiness. I have a pleasing sympathy in the prospect of so much joy, and can never consider the source of it without the most agreeable emotions. He tells me that an oppressive and powerful neighbour had attempted to dispossess him of his inheritance, and had long disturbed all his innocent and social pleasures. I feel an immediate indignation arise in me against such violence and injury. But it is no wonder, he adds, that a private wrong should proceed from a man who had enslaved provinces, depopulated cities, and made the field and scaffold stream with human blood. I am struck with horror at the prospect of so much misery, and am actuated by the strongest antipathy against its author. In general, it is certain that, wherever we go, whatever we reflect on or converse about, everything still presents us with a view of human happiness or misery, and excites in our breast a sympathetic movement of pleasure or uneasiness. In our serious occupations, in our careless amusements, this principle still exerts its active energy. A man who enters the theatre is immediately struck with the view of so great a multitude participating of one common amusement, and experiences, from their very aspect, a superior sensibility or disposition of being affected with every sentiment which he shares with his fellow creatures. He observes the actors to be animated by the appearance of a full audience, and raised to a degree of enthusiasm which they cannot command in any solitary or calm moment. Every movement of the theatre, by a skilful poet, is communicated as it were by magic to the spectators, who weep, tremble, resent, rejoice, and are inflamed with all the variety of passions which actuate the several personages of the drama. Where any event crosses our wishes, and interrupts the happiness of the favourite characters, we feel a sensible anxiety and concern. But where their sufferings proceed from the treachery, cruelty, or tyranny of an enemy, our breasts are affected with the liveliest resentment against the author of these calamities. It is here esteemed contrary to the rules of art to represent anything cool and indifferent. A distant friend or a confidant, who has no immediate interest in the catastrophe, ought, if possible, to be avoided by the poet, as communicating a like indifference to the audience, and checking the progress of the passions. Few species of poetry are more entertaining than pastoral, and every one is sensible that the chief source of its pleasure arises from those images of a gentle and tender tranquillity which it represents in its personages, and of which it communicates a like sentiment to the reader. Sanazarius, who transferred the scene to the seashore, though he presented the most magnificent object in nature, is confessed to have erred in his choice. The idea of toil, labour, and danger suffered by the fisherman is painful, by an unavoidable sympathy which attends every conception of human happiness or misery. When I was twenty, says a French poet, Ovid was my favourite. Now I am forty, I declare for Horace. We enter, to be sure, more readily into sentiments which resemble those we feel every day, but no passion, when well represented, can be entirely indifferent to us, because there is none of which every man has not within him at least the seeds and first principles. It is the business of poetry to bring every affection near to us by lively imagery and representation, and to make it look like truth and reality. A certain proof that, wherever reality is found, our minds are disposed to be strongly affected by it. Any recent event or piece of news by which the fate of states, provinces, or many individuals is affected, is extremely interesting, even to those whose welfare is not immediately engaged. Such intelligence is propagated with celerity, heard with avidity, and inquired into with attention and concern. The interest of society appears on this occasion to be in some degree the interest of each individual. The imagination is sure to be affected, though the passions excited may not always be so strong and steady as to have great influence on the conduct and behaviour. The perusal of a history seems a calm entertainment, but would be no entertainment at all did not our hearts beat with correspondent movements to those which are described by the historian. Thucydides and Guicciardin support with difficulty our attention. While the former describes the trivial encounters of the small cities of Greece, and the latter the harmless wars of Pisa. The few persons interested, and the small interest, fill not the imagination, and engage not the affections. 
the deep distress of the numerous Athenian army before Syracuse, the danger which so nearly threatens Venice, these excite compassion, these move terror and anxiety. The indifferent, uninteresting style of Suetonus, equally with the masterly pencil of Tacitus, may convince us of the cruel depravity of Nero or Tiberius, but what a difference of sentiment! While the former coldly relates the facts, and the latter sets before our eyes the venerable figures of a Seranus and a Thracia, intrepid in their fate, and only moved by the melting sorrows of their friends and kindred. What sympathy then touches every human heart? What indignation against the tyrant, whose causeless fear or unprovoked malice gave rise to such detestable barbarity? If we bring these subjects nearer, if we remove all suspicion of fiction and deceit, what powerful concern is excited, and how much superior, in many instances, to the narrow attachments of self-love and private interest? Popular sedition, party zeal, a devoted obedience to factious leaders, these are some of the most visible, though less laudable, effects of this social sympathy in human nature. The frivolousness of the subject, too, we may observe, is not able to detach us entirely from what carries an image of human sentiment and affection. When a person stutters and pronounces with difficulty, we even sympathise with this trivial uneasiness and suffer for him. And it is a rule in criticism that every combination of syllables or letters which gives pain to the organs of speech in the recital appears also from a species of sympathy harsh and disagreeable to the ear. Nay, when we run over a book with our eye, we are sensible of such unharmonious composition, because we still imagine that a person recites it to us and suffers from the pronunciation of these jarring sounds. So delicate is our sympathy. Easy and unconstrained postures and motions are always beautiful. An air of health and vigour is agreeable. Clothes which warm without burthening the body, which cover without imprisoning the limbs, are well fashioned. In every judgment of beauty, the feelings of the person affected enter into consideration, and communicate to the spectator similar touches of pain or pleasure. What wonder, then, if we can pronounce no judgment concerning the character and conduct of men, without considering the tendencies of their actions, and the happiness or misery which thence arises to society? What association of ideas would ever operate, were that principle here totally unactive? Footnote. In proportion to the station which a man possesses, according to the relations in which he is placed, we always expect from him a greater or less degree of good, and when disappointed, blame his inutility. And much more do we blame him if any ill or prejudice arise from his conduct and behaviour. When the interests of one country interfere with those of another, we estimate the merits of a statesman by the good or ill which results to his own country from his measures and counsels, without regard to the prejudice which he brings on its enemies and rivals. His fellow citizens are the objects which lie nearest the eye, whence we determine his character, and, as nature has implanted in every one a superior affection to his own country, we never expect any regard to distant nations where a competition arises. Not to mention that, while every man consults the good of his own community, we are sensible that the general interest of mankind is better promoted than any loose indeterminate views to the good of a species, whence no beneficial action could ever result for want of a duly limited object on which they could exert themselves. End of footnote. If any man from a cold insensibility or narrow selfishness of temper is unaffected with the images of human happiness or misery, he must be equally indifferent to the images of vice and virtue. As, on the other hand, it is always found that a warm concern for the interests of our species is attended with a delicate feeling of all moral distinctions, a strong resentment of injury done to men, a lively approbation of their welfare. In this particular, Though great superiority is observable of one man above another, yet none are so entirely indifferent to the interest of their fellow creatures as to perceive no distinctions of moral good and evil in the consequence of the different tendencies of actions and principles. How, indeed, can we suppose it possible in any one who wears a human heart that if there be subjected to his censure one character or system of conduct which is beneficial, and another which is pernicious to his species or community, he will not so much as give a cool preference to the former, 
or ascribe to it the smallest merit or regard. Let us suppose such a person ever so selfish, let private interest have engrossed ever so much his attention, yet in instances where that is not concerned, he must unavoidably feel some propensity to the good of mankind, and make it an object of choice, if everything else be equal. Would any man, who is walking along, tread as willingly on another's gouty toes, whom he had no quarrel with, as on the hard flint and pavement? There is here surely a difference in the case. We surely take into consideration the happiness and misery of others, in weighting the several motives of action and inclined to the former, where no private regard draws us to seek on our own promotion or advantage by the injury of our fellow creatures. And if the principles of humanity are capable, in many instances, of influencing our actions, they must, at all times, have some authority over our sentiments, and give us a general approbation of what is useful to society, and blame of what is dangerous or pernicious. The degrees of these sentiments may be the subject of controversy, but the reality of their existence, one should think, must be admitted in every theory and system. A creature, absolutely malicious and spiteful, were there any such in nature, must be worse than indifferent to the images of vice and virtue. All his sentiments must be inverted, and directly opposed to those which prevail in the human species. Whatever contributes to the good of mankind, as it crosses the constant bent of his wishes and desires, must produce uneasiness and disapprobation. And, on the contrary, whatever is the source of disorder and misery in society must, for the same reason, be regarded with pleasure and complacency. Timon, who probably from his affected spleen more than an inveterate malice, was denominated the man-hater, embraced Alcibiades with great fondness. Go on, my boy, cried he, acquire the confidence of the people. You will one day, I foresee, be the cause of great calamities to them. Could we admit the two principles of the Manichaeans, it is an infallible consequence that their sentiments of human actions, as well as of everything else, must be totally opposite, and that every instance of justice and humanity, from its necessary tendency, must please the one deity, and displease the other. All mankind so far resemble the good principle, that where interest or revenge or envy perverts not our disposition, we are always inclined, from our natural philanthropy, to give the preference to the happiness of society, and consequently to virtue above its opposite. Absolute, unprovoked, disinterested malice has never perhaps place in any human breast, or if it had, it must there pervert all sentiments of morals, as well as the feelings of humanity. If the cruelty of Nero be allowed entirely voluntary, and not rather the effect of constant fear and resentment, it is evident that Tigellinus, preferably to Seneca or Burrus, must have possessed his steady and uniform approbation. A statesman or patriot who serves our own country in our own time has always a more passionate regard paid to him than one whose beneficial influence operated on distant ages or remote nations, where the good, resulting from his generous humanity, being less connected with us, seems more obscure, and affects us with a less lively sympathy. We may own the merit to be equally great, though our sentiments are not raised to an equal height, in both cases. The judgment here corrects the inequalities of our internal emotions and perceptions. In like manner, as it preserves us from error in the several variations of images presented to our external senses. The same object, at a double distance, really throws on the eye a picture of but half the bulk, yet we imagine that it appears the same size in both situations, because we know that on our approach to it, its image would expand on the eye, and that the difference consists not in the object itself, but in our position with regard to it. And, indeed, without such a correction of appearances, both in internal and external sentiment, men could never think or talk steadily on any subject, while their fluctuating situations produce a continual variation on objects, and throw them into such different and contrary lights and positions. Footnote. For a little reason, the tendencies of actions and characters, not their real accidental consequences, are alone regarded in our more determinations or general judgments. Though in our real feeling or sentiment we cannot help paying greater regard to one whose station joined to virtue renders him really useful to society, than to one who exerts the social virtues only in good intentions and benevolent affections. Separating the character from the furtin, 
by an easy and necessary effort of thought, we pronounce these persons alike, and give them the appearance, but it is not able entirely to prevail our sentiment. Why is this peach tree said to be better than that other, but because it produces more or better fruit? And would not the same praise be given it, though snails or vermin had destroyed the peaches before they came to full maturity? In morals, too, is not the tree known by the fruit? And cannot we easily distinguish between nature and accident in the one case, as well as in the other? End footnote. The more we converse with mankind, and the greater social intercourse we maintain, the more shall we be familiarized to those general preferences and distinctions, without which our conversation and discourse could scarcely be rendered intelligible to each other. Every man's interest is peculiar to himself, and aversions and desires, which result from it, cannot be supposed to affect others in a like degree. General language, therefore, being formed for general use, must be moulded on some more general views, and must affix the epithets of praise or blame in conformity to sentiments which arise from the general interests of the community. And if these sentiments, in most men, be not so strong as those which have a reference to private good, yet still they must make some distinction, even in persons the most depraved and selfish, and must attach the notion of good to a beneficent conduct, and of evil to the contrary. Sympathy, we shall allow, is much fainter than our concern for ourselves, and sympathy with persons remote from us much fainter than that with persons near and contiguous. But for this very reason, it is necessary for us, in our calm judgments and discourse concerning the characters of men, to neglect all these differences, and render our sentiments more public and social. Besides, that we ourselves often change our situation in this particular, we every day meet with persons who are in a situation different from us, and who could never converse with us, were we to remain constantly in that position and point of view which is peculiar to ourselves. The intercourse of sentiments, therefore, in society and conversation, makes us form some general unalterable standard by which we may approve or disapprove of characters and manners. And though the heart takes not part entirely with those general notions, nor regulates all its love and hatred by the universal abstract differences of vice and virtue without regard to self, or the persons with whom we are more intimately connected, yet have those moral differences a considerable influence, and, being sufficient, at least for discourse, serve all our purposes in company, in the pulpit, on the theatre, and in the schools. Footnote. It is wisely ordained by nature that private connections should commonly prevail over universal views and considerations. Otherwise our affections and actions would be dissipated and lost for a want of a proper limited object. Thus a small benefit done to ourselves or our near friends excites more lively sentiments of love and approbation than a great benefit done to a distant commonwealth. But still we know here, as in all the senses, to correct these inequalities by reflection, and retain a general standard of vice and virtue, founded chiefly on a general usefulness. End footnote. Thus, in whatever light we take this subject, the merit ascribed to the social virtues appears still uniform, and arises chiefly from that regard which the natural sentiment of benevolence engages us to pay to the interests of mankind and society. If we consider the principles of the human make, such as they appear to daily experience and observation, we must, a priori, conclude it impossible for such a creature as man to be totally indifferent to the well or ill-being of his fellow creatures, and not readily of himself to pronounce where nothing gives him any particular bias, that what promotes their happiness is good, what tends to their misery is evil, without any farther regard or consideration. Here, then, are the faint rudiments, at least, or outlines, of a general distinction between actions, and, in proportion as the humanity of the person is supposed to increase his connection with those who are injured or benefited, and his lively conception of their misery or happiness, his consequent censure or approbation acquires proportionable vigour. There is no necessity that a generous action, barely mentioned in an old history or remote gazette, should communicate any strong feelings of applause or admiration. Virtue, placed at such a distance, 
is like a fixed star. Though to the eyes of reason it may appear as luminous as the sun in his meridian, is so infinitely removed as to affect the senses, neither with light nor heat. Bring this virtue nearer, by our acquaintance or connection with the persons, or even by an eloquent recital of the case, our hearts are immediately caught, our sympathy enlivened, and our cool approbation converted into the warmest sentiments of friendship and regard. These seem necessary and infallible consequences of the general principles of human nature as discovered in common life and practice. Again, reverse these views and reasonings. Consider the matter a posteriori, and weighing the consequences, inquire if the merit of social virtue be not, in a great measure, derived from the feelings of humanity with which it affects the spectators. It appears to be matter of fact that the circumstance of utility, in all subjects, is a source of praise and approbation, that it is constantly appealed to in all moral decisions concerning the merit and demerit of actions, that it is the sole source of that high regard paid to justice, fidelity, honour, allegiance, and chastity, that it is inseparable from all other social virtues, humanity, generosity, charity, affability, lenity, mercy, and moderation, and, in a word, that it is a foundation of the chief part of morals, which has a reference to mankind and our fellow creatures. It appears also that in our general approbation of characters and manners, the useful tendency of the social virtues moves us not by any regards to self-interest, but has an influence much more universal and extensive. It appears that a tendency to public good, and to the promoting of peace, harmony, and order in society, does always, by affecting the benevolent principles of our frame, engage us on the side of the social virtues. And it appears, as an additional confirmation, that these principles of humanity and sympathy enter so deeply into all our sentiments, and have so powerful an influence, as may enable them to excite the strongest censure and applause. The present theory is the simple result of all these inferences, each of which seems founded on uniform experience and observation. Were it doubtful whether there were any such principle in our nature as humanity or a concern for others, Yet, when we see in numberless instances that whatever has a tendency to promote the interests of society is so highly approved of, we ought thence to learn the force of the benevolent principle, since it is impossible for anything to please as a means to an end where the end is totally indifferent. On the other hand, were it doubtful whether there were implanted in our nature any general principle of moral blame and approbation, yet, when we see in numberless instances the influence of humanity, we ought thence to conclude that it is impossible but that everything which promotes the interest of society must communicate pleasure, and what is pernicious gives uneasiness. But when these different reflections and observations concur in establishing the same conclusion, must they not bestow an undisputed evidence upon it? It is, however, hoped that the progress of this argument will bring a farther confirmation of the present theory, by showing the rise of other sentiments of esteem and regard from the same or like principles. End of section 8. Recording by Lucas Balding. Section 9 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume Section 6 of Qualities Useful to Ourselves, Part 1 It seems evident that where a quality or habit is subjected to our examination, if it appear in any respect prejudicial to the person possessed of it, or such as incapacitates him for business and action, it is instantly blamed and ranked among his faults and imperfections. Indolence, negligence, want of order and method, obstinacy, fickleness, rashness, credulity, these qualities were never esteemed by any one indifferent to a character much less extolled as accomplishments or virtues. The prejudice resulting from them immediately strikes our eye, 
and gives us the sentiment of pain and disapprobation. No quality, it is allowed, is absolutely either blamable or praiseworthy. It is all according to its degree. A due medium, says the peripatetics, is the characteristic of virtue. But this medium is chiefly determined by utility. A proper celerity, for instance, and dispatch in business, is commendable. When defective, no progress is ever made in the execution of any purpose. When excessive, it engages us in precipitate and ill-concerted measures and enterprises. By such reasonings, we fix the proper and commendable mediocrity in all moral and prudential disquisitions, and never lose view of the advantages which result from any character or habit. Now, as these advantages are enjoyed by the person possessed of the character, it can never be self-love which renders the prospect of them agreeable to us, the spectators, and prompts our esteem and approbation. No force of imagination can convert us into another person, and make us fancy that we, being that person, reap benefit from those valuable qualities which belong to him. Or if it did, no celerity of imagination could immediately transport us back into ourselves, and make us love and esteem the person as different from us. Views and sentiments so opposite to known truth and to each other could never have place at the same time in the same person. All suspicion, therefore, of selfish regards is here totally excluded. It is a quite different principle which actuates our bosom and interests us in the felicity of the person whom we contemplate. Where his natural talents and acquired abilities give us the prospect of elevation, advancement, a figure in life, prosperous success, a steady command over fortune, and the execution of great or advantageous undertakings, we are struck with such agreeable images, and feel a complacency and regard immediately arise toward him. The ideas of happiness, joy, triumph, prosperity, are connected with every circumstance of his character, and diffuse over our minds a pleasing sentiment of sympathy and humanity. Footnote. One may venture to affirm that there is no human nature to whom the appearance of happiness, where envy or revenge has no place, does not give pleasure, that of misery, uneasiness. This seems inseparable from our make and constitution, but they are only more generous minds that are thence prompted to seek zealously the good of others, and to have a real passion for their welfare. With men of narrow and ungenerous spirits, this sympathy goes not beyond a slight feeling of the imagination, which serves only to excite sentiments of complacency or ensure, and make them apply to the object either honourable or dishonourable appellations. A griping miser, for instance, praises extremely industry and frugality even in others, and sets them in his estimation above all the other virtues. He knows the good that results from them, and feels that species of happiness with a more lively sympathy than any other you could represent to him, though perhaps he would not part with a shilling to make the fortune of the industrious man whom he praises so highly. End of footnote. Let us suppose a person originally framed so as to have no manner of concern for his fellow creatures, but to regard the happiness and misery of all sensible beings with greater indifference than even two contiguous shades of the same colour. Let us suppose, if the prosperity of nations were laid on the one hand, and their ruin on the other, and he were desired to choose, that he would stand like the schoolman's ass, irresolute and undetermined between equal motives or rather, like the same ass, between two pieces of wood or marble, without any inclination or propensity to either side. The consequence, I believe, must be allowed just, that such a person, being absolutely unconcerned, either for the public good of a community, or the private utility of others, would look on every quality, however pernicious, or however beneficial, to society or to its possessor, with the same indifference as on the most common and uninteresting object. But if, instead of this fancied monster, we suppose a man to form judgment or determination in the case, there is to him a plain foundation of preference, where everything else is equal. And however cool his choice may be, if his heart be selfish, 
or if the persons interested be remote from him, there must still be a choice or distinction between what is useful and what is pernicious. Now this distinction is the same in all its parts with the moral distinction, whose foundation has been so often and so much in vain inquired after. The same endowments of the mind, in every circumstance, are agreeable to the sentiment of morals and to that of humanity. The same temper is susceptible of high degrees of the one sentiment and of the other, and the same alteration in the objects, by their nearer approach, or by connections, enlivens the one and the other. By all the rules of philosophy, therefore, we must conclude that these sentiments are originally the same, since, in each particular, even the most minute, they are governed by the same laws, and are moved by the same objects. Why do philosophers infer, with the greatest certainty, that the moon is kept in its orbit by the same force of gravity that makes bodies fall near the surface of the earth, but because these effects are, upon computation, found similar and equal? And must not this argument bring a strong conviction in moral as in natural disquisitions? To prove, by any long detail, that all the qualities useful to the possessor are approved of, and the contrary censured, would be superfluous. The least reflection on what is every day experienced in life will be sufficient. We shall only mention a few instances, in order to remove, if possible, all doubt and hesitation. The quality, the most necessary for the execution of any useful enterprise, is discretion by which we carry a safe intercourse with others, give due attention to our own and to their character, weigh each circumstance of the business which we undertake, and employ the surest and safest means for the attainment of any end or purpose. To a Cromwell, perhaps, or a de Retz, discretion may appear an alderman-like virtue, as Dr. Swift calls it, and, being incompatible with those vast designs to which their courage and ambition prompted them, it might really, in them, be a fault or imperfection. But in the conduct of ordinary life, no virtue is the more requisite, not only to obtain success, but to avoid the most fatal miscarriages and disappointments. The greatest parts without it, as observed by an elegant writer, may be fatal to their owner, as Polyphemus, deprived of his eye, was only the more exposed on account of his enormous strength and stature. The best character, indeed, were it not rather too perfect for human nature, is that which is not swayed by temper of any kind, but alternately employs enterprise and caution, as each is useful to the particular purpose intended. Such is the excellence which saint Evremond ascribed to Marechal Turenne, who displayed in every campaign, as he grew older, more temerity in his military enterprises, and, being now, from long experience, perfectly acquainted with every incident in war, he advanced with greater firmness and security, in a road so well known to him. Fabius, says Machiavel, was cautious, Scipio, enterprising, and both succeeded, because the situation of the Roman affairs, during the command of each, was peculiarly adapted to his genius, but both would have failed had these situations been reversed. He is happy whose circumstances suit his temper, but he is more excellent who can suit his temper to any circumstances. What need is there to display the praises of industry and to extol its advantages in the acquisition of power and riches, or in raising what we call a fortune in the world? The tortoise, according to the fable, by his perseverance, gained the race of the hare, though possessed of much superior swiftness. A man's time, when well husbanded, is like a cultivated field, of which a few acres produce more of what is useful to life than extensive provinces even of the richest soil, when overrun with weeds and brambles. But all prospect of success in life, or even of tolerable subsistence, must fail where a reasonable frugality is wanting. The heap, instead of increasing, diminishes daily, and leaves its possessor so much more unhappy, as, not having been able to confine his expenses to a large revenue, he will still less be able to live contentedly on a small one. The souls of men, according to Plato, inflamed with impure appetites, and losing the body, which alone afforded means of satisfaction, hover about the earth, 
and haunt the places where their bodies are deposited, possessed with a longing desire to recover the lost organs of sensation. So may we see worthless prodigals, having consumed their fortune in wild debauches, thrusting themselves into every plentiful table and every party of pleasure, hated even by the vicious and despised even by fools. The one extreme of frugality is avarice, which, as it both deprives a man of all use of his riches, and checks hospitality and every social enjoyment, is justly censured on a double account. Prodigality, on the other extreme, is commonly more hurtful to a man himself, and each of these extremes is blamed above the other, according to the temper of the person who censures, and according to his greater or less sensibility to pleasure, either social or sensual. Qualities often derive their merit from complicated sources. Honesty, fidelity, truth, are praised for their immediate tendency to promote the interests of society. But after those virtues are once established upon this foundation, they are also considered as advantageous to the person himself, and as the source of that trust and confidence which can alone give a man any consideration in life. One becomes contemptible, no less than odious, when he forgets the duty which, in this particular, he owes to himself as well as to society. Perhaps this consideration is one chief source of the high blame which is thrown on any instance of failure among women in the point of chastity. The greatest regard which can be acquired by that sex is derived from their fidelity, and a woman becomes cheap and vulgar, loses her rank, and is exposed to every insult who is deficient in this particular. The smallest failure here is sufficient to blast her character. A female has so many opportunities of secretly indulging these appetites, that nothing can give us security but her absolute modesty and reserve. And where a breach is once made, it can scarcely ever be fully repaired. If a man behave with cowardice on one occasion, a contrary conduct reinstates him in his character. But by what action can a woman, whose behaviour has once been dissolute, be able to assure us that she has formed better resolutions, and has self-command enough to carry them into execution? All men, it is allowed, are equally desirous of happiness, but few are successful in the pursuit. One considerable cause is the want of strength of mind, which might enable them to resist the temptation of our present ease or pleasure, and carry them forward in the search of more distant profit and enjoyment. Our affections, on a general prospect of their objects, form certain rules of conduct and certain measures of preference of one above another, and these decisions, though really the result of our calm passions and propensities, for what else can pronounce any object eligible or the contrary, are yet said, by a natural abuse of terms, to be the determinations of pure reason and reflection. But when some of these objects approach nearer to us, or acquire the advantages of favourable lights and positions, which catch the heart or imagination, our general resolutions are frequently confounded, a small enjoyment preferred, and lasting shame and sorrow entailed upon us. And however poets may employ their wit and eloquence in celebrating present pleasure, and rejecting all distant views to fame, health, or fortune, it is obvious that this practice is the source of all dissoluteness and disorder, repentance and misery. A man of a strong and determined temper adheres tenaciously to his general resolutions, and is neither seduced by the allurements of pleasure, nor terrified by the menaces of pain, but keeps still in view those distant pursuits by which he at once ensures his happiness and his honour. Self-satisfaction, at least in some degree, is an advantage which equally attends the fool and the wise man. But it is the only one, nor is there any other circumstance in the conduct of life where they are upon an equal footing. Business, books, conversation, for all of these a fool is totally incapacitated, and except condemned by his station to the coarsest drudgery, remains a useless burthen upon the earth. Accordingly, it is found that men are extremely jealous of their character in this particular, and many instances are seen of profligacy and treachery, the most avowed and unreserved. 
none of bearing patiently the imputation of ignorance and stupidity. Diceacus, the Macedonian general, who, as Polybius tells us, openly erected one altar to impiety, another to injustice, in order to bid defiance to mankind, even he, I am well assured, would have started at the epithet of fool, and have mediated revenge for so injurious an appellation. Except the affection of parents, the strongest and most indissoluble bond in nature, no connection has strength sufficient to support the disgust arising from this character. Love itself, which can subsist under treachery, ingratitude, malice, and infidelity, is immediately extinguished by it, when perceived and acknowledged, nor a deformity and old age more fatal to the dominion of that passion. So dreadful are the ideas of an utter incapacity for any purpose or undertaking, and of continued error and misconduct in life. When it is asked whether a quick or a slow apprehension be most valuable, whether one that at first penetrates far into a subject, but can perform nothing upon study, or a contrary character, which must work out everything by dint of application, whether a clear head or a copious invention, whether a profound genius or a sure judgment. In short, what character or peculiar turn of understanding is more excellent than another? It is evident that we can answer none of these questions without considering which of those qualities capacitates a man best for the world and carries him farthest in any undertaking. If refined sense and exalted sense be not so useful as common sense, their rarity, their novelty, and the nobleness of their objects make some compensation, and render them the admiration of mankind. As gold, though less serviceable than iron, acquires from its scarcity a value which is much superior. The defects of judgment can be supplied by no art or invention, but those of memory frequently may, both in business and in study, by method and industry, and by diligence in committing everything to writing, and we scarcely ever hear a short memory given as a reason for a man's failure in any undertaking. But in ancient times, when no man could make a figure without the talent of speaking, and when the audience were too delicate to bear such crude, undigested harangues as our extempore orators offer to public assemblies, the faculty of memory was then of the utmost consequence, and was accordingly much more valued than at present. Scarce any great genius is mentioned in antiquity who is not celebrated for this talent, and Cicero enumerates it among other sublime qualities of Caesar himself. Particular customs and manners alter the usefulness of qualities. They also alter their merit. Particular situations and accidents have, in some degree, the same influence, he will always be more esteemed who possesses those talents and accomplishments which suit his station and profession than he whom fortune has misplaced in the part which she has assigned him. The private or selfish virtues are, in this respect, more arbitrary than the public and social. In other respects, they are perhaps less liable to doubt and controversy. In this kingdom, such continued ostentation of late years has prevailed among men in active life with regard to public spirit, and among those in speculative with regard to benevolence, and so many false pretensions to each have been, no doubt, detected, that men of the world are apt, without any bad intention, to discover a sullen incredulity on the head of those moral endowments, and even sometimes absolutely to deny their existence and reality. In like manner, I find, that, of old, the perpetual cant of the Stoics and Cynics concerning virtue, their magnificent professions and slender performances, bred a disgust in mankind, and Lucian, who, though licentious with regard to pleasure, is yet in other respects a very moral writer, cannot sometimes talk of virtue, so much boasted, without betraying the symptoms of spleen and irony. But surely this peevish delicacy, whence ever it arises, can never be carried so far as to make us deny the existence of every species of merit, and all distinction of manners and behaviour. Besides discretion, caution, enterprise, industry, assiduity, frugality, economy, good sense, prudence, discernment, beside these endowments, I say, whose very names force an avowal of their merit, there are many others, 
to which the most determined scepticism cannot for a moment refuse the tribute of praise and approbation. Temperance, sobriety, patience, constancy, perseverance, forethought, considerateness, secrecy, order, insinuation, address, presence of mind, quickness of conception, facility of expression. These, and a thousand more of the same kind, no man will ever deny to be excellencies and perfections. As their merit consists in their tendency to serve the person possessed of them, without any magnificent claim to public or social desert, we are the less jealous of their pretensions, and readily admit them into the catalogue of laudable qualities. We are not sensible that, by this concession, we have paved the way for all other moral excellencies, and cannot consistently hesitate any longer with regard to disinterested benevolence, patriotism, and humanity. It seems, indeed, certain that first appearances are here, as usual, extremely deceitful, and that it is more difficult, in a speculative way, to resolve into self-love the merit which we ascribe to the selfish virtues above mentioned, than that even of the social virtues, justice, and beneficence. For this latter purpose, we need but say that whatever conduct promotes the good of the community is loved, praised, and esteemed by the community, on account of that utility and interest, of which everyone partakes. And though this affection and regard be, in reality, gratitude, not self-love, yet a distinction even of this obvious nature may not readily be made by superficial reasoners, and there is room, at least, to support the cavil and dispute for a moment. But as qualities, which tend only to the utility of their possessor, without any reference to us or to the community, are yet esteemed and valued, by what theory or system can we account for this sentiment from self-love, or deduce it from that favourite origin? There seems here a necessity for confessing that the happiness and misery of others are not spectacles entirely indifferent to us, but that the view of the former, whether in causes or effects, like sunshine, or the prospect of well-cultivated plains, to carry our pretensions no higher, communicates a secret joy and satisfaction. The appearance of the latter, like a lowering cloud or barren landscape, throws a melancholy damp over the imagination. And this concession being once made, the difficulty is over, and a natural, unforced interpretation of the phenomena of human life will afterwards, we may hope, prevail among all speculative inquirers. End of section 9. Recording by Lucas Bolding. Section 10 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume Section 6 Of Qualities Useful to Ourselves Part 2 It may not be improper, in this place, to examine the influence of bodily endowments and of the goods of fortune over our sentiments of regard and esteem, and to consider whether these phenomena fortify or weaken the present theory. It will naturally be expected that the beauty of the body, as is supposed by all ancient moralists, will be similar, in some respects, to that of the mind, and that every kind of esteem, which is paid to a man, will have something similar in its origin, whether it arise from his mental endowments, or from the situation of his exterior circumstances. It is evident that one considerable source of beauty in all animals is the advantage which they reap from the particular structure of their limbs and members, suitably to the particular manner of life to which they are by nature destined. The just proportions of a horse, described by Xenophon and Virgil, are the same that are received at this day by our modern jockeys, because the foundation of them is the same, namely the experience of what is detrimental or useful in the animal. Broad shoulders, a lank belly, firm joints, taper legs. All these are beautiful in our species because signs of force and vigour. Ideas of utility in its contrary, though they do not entirely determine what is handsome or deformed, are evidently the source of a considerable part of approbation or dislike. In ancient times, 
bodily strength and dexterity, being of greater use and importance in war, was also much more esteemed and valued than at present. Not to insist on Homer and the poets, we may observe that historians scruple not to mention force of body among the other accomplishments, even of Epaminondas, whom they acknowledge to be the greatest hero, statesman, and general of all the Greeks. A like praise is given to Pompey, one of the greatest of the Romans. Footnote. Diodorus Siculus, Libba 15. It may be improper to give the character of Epaminondas, as drawn by the historian, in order to show the idea of perfect merit which prevailed in those ages. In other illustrious men, say he, you will observe, that each possessed some one shining quality which was the foundation of his fame. In Epaminondas, all the virtues are found united. Force of body, eloquence of expression, vigour of mind, contempt of riches, gentleness of disposition, and what is chiefly to be regarded, courage and conduct of war. End footnote. This instance is similar to what we observed above with regard to memory. What derision and contempt with both sexes attend impotence? While the unhappy object is regarded as one deprived of so capital a pleasure in life, and at the same time as disabled from communicating it to others, barrenness in women, being also a species of inutility, is a reproach, but not in the same degree, of which the reason is very obvious, according to the present theory. There is no rule in painting or statuary more indispensable than that of balancing the figures and placing them with the greatest exactness on their proper centre of gravity. A figure which is not justly balanced is ugly, because it conveys the disagreeable ideas of fall, harm, and pain. Footnote. All men are equally liable to pain and disease and sickness, and may again recover health and ease. These circumstances, as they make no distinction between one man and another, are no source of pride or humility, regard or contempt. But comparing our own species to superior ones, it is a very mortifying consideration that we should all be so liable to diseases and infirmities, and divines accordingly employ this topic in order to depress self-conceit and vanity. They would have more success if the common bent of our thoughts were not perpetually turned to compare ourselves with others. The infirmities of old age are mortifying, because a comparison with the young may take place. The king's evil is industriously concealed because it affects others, and is often transmitted to posterity. The case is nearly the same with such diseases as convey any nauseous or frightful images, the epilepsy, for instance, ulcers, sores, scabs, etc. End footnote. A disposition or turn of mind which qualifies a man to rise in the world and advance his fortune is entitled to esteem and regard, as has already been explained. It may, therefore, naturally be supposed that the actual possession of riches and authority will have a considerable influence over these sentiments. Let us examine any hypothesis by which we can account for the regard paid to the rich and powerful. We shall find none satisfactory but that which derives it from the enjoyment communicated to the spectator by the images of prosperity, happiness, ease, plenty, authority, and the gratification of every appetite. Self-love, for instance, which some affect so much to consider as the source of every sentiment, is plainly insufficient for this purpose. Where no goodwill or friendship appears, it is difficult to conceive on what we can found our hope of advantage from the riches of others, though we naturally respect the rich, even before they discover any such favourable disposition towards us. We are affected with the same sentiments when we lie so much out of the sphere of their activity that they cannot even be supposed to possess the power of serving us. A prisoner of war, in all civilised nations, is treated with a regard suited to his condition, and riches, it is evident, go far towards fixing the condition of any person. If birth and quality enter for a share, this still affords us an argument to our present purpose. For what is it we call a man of birth, but one who is descended from a long succession of rich and powerful ancestors, and who acquires our esteem by his connections with persons whom we esteem? His ancestors, therefore, though dead, are respected in some measure on account of their riches, and, consequently, without any kind of expectation. 
but not to go so far as prisoners of war or the dead to find instances of this disinterested regard for riches, we may only observe, with a little attention, those phenomena which occur in common life and conversation. A man, who is himself, we shall suppose, of a competent fortune, and of no profession, being introduced to a company of strangers, naturally treats them with different degrees of respect, as he is informed of their different fortunes and conditions, though it is impossible that he can so suddenly propose, and perhaps he would not accept, of any pecuniary advantage from them. A traveller is always admitted into company, and meets with civility in proportion, as his train and equipage speak of him as a man of great or moderate fortune. In short, the different ranks of men are, in a great measure, regulated by riches, and that with regard to superiors, as well as inferiors, strangers, as well as acquaintances. What remains, therefore, but to conclude that, as riches are desired for ourselves only as the means of gratifying our appetites, either at present or in some imaginary future period, they beget esteem in others merely from their having that influence. This, indeed, is their very nature or offence. They have a direct reference to the commodities, conveniences, and pleasures of life. The bill of a banker, who is broke, or gold in a desert island, would otherwise be full as valuable. When we approach a man who is, as we say, at his ease, we are presented with the pleasing ideas of plenty, satisfaction, cleanliness, warmth, a cheerful house, elegant furniture, ready service, and whatever is desirable in meat, drink, or apparel. On the contrary, when a poor man appears, the disagreeable images of want, penury, hard labour, dirty furniture, coarse or ragged clothes, nauseous meat, and distasteful liquor, immediately strike our fancy. What else do we mean by saying that one is rich, the other poor? And as regard or contempt is the natural consequence of those different situations in life, it is easy to see what additional light and evidence this throws upon our preceding theory with regard to all moral distinctions. Footnote. There is something extraordinary and seemingly unaccountable in the operation of our passions when we consider the fortune and situation of others. Very often another's advancement and prosperity produces envy, which has a strong mixture of hatred, and arises chiefly from the comparison of ourselves with the person. At the very same time, or at least in very short intervals, we may feel the passion of respect, which is a species of affection or goodwill, with a mixture of humility. On the other hand, the misfortunes of our fellows often causes pity, which has in it a strong mixture of goodwill. This sentiment of pity is nearly allied to contempt, which is a species of dislike, with a mixture of pride. I only point out these phenomena as a subject of speculation to such as are curious with regard to moral inquiries. It is sufficient for the present purpose to observe in general that power and riches commonly cause respect, poverty and meanness contempt, though particular views and incidents may sometimes raise the passions of envy and pity. End footnote. A man who has cured himself of all ridiculous prepossessions, and is fully, sincerely, and steadily convinced, from experience as well as philosophy, that the difference of fortune makes less difference in happiness than is vulgarly imagined, such a one does not measure out degrees of esteem according to the rent rolls of his acquaintance. He may, indeed, externally pay a superior deference to the great lord above the vassal, because riches are the most convenient, being the most fixed and determinate source of distinction but his internal sentiments are more regulated by the personal characters of men than by the accidental and capricious favours of fortune. In most countries of Europe, family, that is, hereditary riches, marked with titles and symbols from the sovereign, is the chief source of distinction. In England, more regard is paid to present opulence and plenty. Each practice has its advantages and disadvantages. Where birth is respected, Unactive, spiritless minds remain in haughty indolence, and dream of nothing but pedigrees and genealogies. The generous and ambitious seek honour and authority, and reputation and favour. Where riches are the chief idol, corruption, venality, rapine prevail. Arts, manufactures, commerce, agriculture flourish. 
the former prejudice, being favourable to military virtue, is more suited to monarchies. The latter, being the chief spur to industry, agrees better with a republican government. And we accordingly find that each of these forms of government, by varying the utility of those customs, has commonly a proportionable effect on the sentiments of mankind. End of section 10. Recording by Lucas Bolding. Section 11 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Webster. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. By David Hume. Section 7. Of Qualities Immediately Agreeable to Ourselves. Whoever has passed an evening with serious melancholy people, and has observed how suddenly the conversation was animated, and what sprightliness diffused itself over the countenance, discourse, and behaviour of every one on the ascension of a good humoured, lively companion, such a one will easily allow their cheerfulness carries great merit with it, and naturally conciliates the good will of mankind. No quality, indeed, more readily communicates itself to all around, because no one has a greater propensity to display itself in jovial talk and pleasant entertainment. The flame spreads through the whole circle, and the most sullen and morose are often caught by it. That the melancholy hate the merry, even though Horace says it, I have some difficulty to allow, because I have always observed that, where the jollity is moderate and decent, serious people are so much the more delighted, as it dissipates the gloom with which they are commonly oppressed, and gives them an unusual enjoyment. From this influence of cheerfulness, both to communicate itself and to engage approbation, we may perceive that there is another set of mental qualities which, without any utility or any tendency to farther good, either of the community or of the possessor, diffuse a satisfaction on the beholders, and procure friendship and regard. Their immediate sensation to the person possessed of them is agreeable. Others enter into the same humour and catch the sentiment by a contagion or natural sympathy. And as we cannot forbear loving whatever pleases, a kindly emotion arises towards the person who communicates so much satisfaction. He is a more animating spectacle. His presence diffuses over us more serene complacency and enjoyment. Our imagination, entering into his feelings and disposition, is affected in a more agreeable manner than if a melancholy, dejected, sullen, anxious temper were presented to us. Hence the affection and probation which attend the former, the aversion and disgust with which we regard the latter. Footnote. There is no man who, on particular occasions, is not affected with all the disagreeable passions, fear, anger, dejection, grief, melancholy, anxiety, etc., but these, so far as they are natural and universal, make no difference between one man and another, and can never be the object of blame. It is only when the disposition gives a propensity to any of these disagreeable passions that they disfigure the character, and by giving uneasiness, convey the sentiment of disapprobation to the spectator. Few men would envy the character which Caesar gives of Cassius, he loves no play, as thou dost, Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort, as if he mocked himself, and scorned his spirit, that could be moved to smile at anything. Not only such men, as Caesar adds, are commonly dangerous, but also, having little enjoyment within themselves, they can never become agreeable to others, or contribute to social entertainment. 
in all polite nations and ages, a relish for pleasure, if accompanied with temperance and decency, is esteemed a considerable merit, even in the greatest men, and becomes still more requisite in those of inferior rank and character. It is an agreeable representation which a French writer gives of the situation of his own mind in this particular. Virtue I love, says he, without austerity, pleasure without effeminacy, and life without fearing its end. Footnote. J'aime la vertu sans rudesse, j'aime le plaisir sans mollesse, j'aime la vie et n'en crains pas la fin. Saint Evremont. Who is not struck with any signal instance of greatness of mind or dignity of character, with elevation of sentiment, disdain of slavery, and with that noble pride and spirit which arises from conscious virtue? The sublime, says Longinus, is often nothing but the echo or image of magnanimity. And where this quality appears in any one, even though a syllable be not uttered, it excites our applause and admiration, as may be observed of the famous silence of Ajax in the Odyssey, which expresses more noble disdain and resolute indignation than any language can convey. Were I, Alexander, said Parmenio, I would accept of these offers made by Darius. So would I too, replied Alexander. Were I Parmenio? This saying is admirable, says Longinus, from a like principle. Go, cries the same hero to his soldiers, when they refused to follow him to the Indies. Go tell your countrymen, that you left, Alexander, completing the conquest of the world. Alexander, said the Prince of Condé, who always admired this passage, abandoned by his soldiers, among barbarians, not yet fully subdued, felt in himself such a dignity and right of empire, that he could not believe it possible that any one would refuse to obey him. Whether in Europe or in Asia, among Greeks or Persians, all was indifferent to him. Wherever he found men, he fancied he should find subjects. The confidant of Medea in the tragedy recommends caution and submission, and enumerating all the distresses of that unfortunate heroine, asks her what she has to support her against her numerous and implacable enemies. Myself, replies she, Myself, I say, and it is enough. Boileau justly recommends this passage as an instance of true sublime. When Fauchon, the modest, the gentle Fauchon, was led to execution, he turned to one of his fellow sufferers who was lamenting his own hard fate. Is it not glory enough for you, says he, that you die with Fauchon? Place in opposition the picture which Tacitus draws of Vitellius, fallen from empire, prolonging his ignominy from a wretched love of life, delivered over to the merciless rabble, tossed, buffeted, and kicked about, constrained by their holding a poniard under his chin to raise his head and expose himself to every contumely. What abject infamy! What low humiliation! Yet even here, says the historian, he discovered some symptoms of a mind not wholly degenerate. To a tribune, who insulted him, he replied, I am still your emperor. Footnote. Tacitus, Histories, Book 3. The author entering upon the narration, says, Laniata veste, foidum spectaculum ducebatur, multis increpantibus, nullo in lacrimante, Deformitas exitus misericordiam abstulerat. To enter thoroughly into this method of thinking, we must make allowance for the ancient maxims, that no one ought to prolong his life after it became dishonourable. But, as he had always a right to dispose of it, it then became a duty to part with it. 
We never excuse the absolute want of spirit and dignity of character, or a proper sense of what is due to oneself, in society and the common intercourse of life. This vice constitutes what we properly call meanness. When a man can submit to the basest slavery in order to gain his ends, fawn upon those who abuse him, and degrade himself by intimacies and familiarities with undeserving inferiors. A certain degree of generous pride or self-value is so requisite that the absence of it in the mind displeases, after the same manner as the want of a nose, eye, or any of the most material feature of the face or member of the body. Footnote The absence of virtue may often be a vice and that of the highest kind, as in the instance of ingratitude, as well as meanness. Where we expect a beauty, the disappointment gives an uneasy sensation, and produces a real deformity. An abjectness of character, likewise, is disgustful and contemptible in another view. Where a man has no sense of value in himself, we are not likely to have any higher esteem of him. And if the same person, who crouches to his superiors, is insolent to his inferiors, as often happens, this contrariety of behaviour, instead of correcting the former vice, aggravates it extremely by the addition of a vice still more odious. The utility of courage both to the public and to the person possessed of it, is an obvious foundation of merit. But to any one who duly considers of the matter, it will appear that this quality has a peculiar lustre, which it derives wholly from itself, and from that noble elevation inseparable from it. Its figure, drawn by painters and by poets, displays, in each feature, a sublimity and daring confidence, which catches the eye, engages the affections, and diffuses, by sympathy, a like sublimity of sentiment over every spectator. Under what shining colours does Demosthenes represent Philip? Where the orator apologises for his own administration, and justifies that pertinacious love of liberty with which he had inspired the Athenians. I beheld Philip, says he, he with whom was your contest, resolutely, while in pursuit of empire and dominion, exposing himself to every wound, his eye gored, his neck rested, his arm, his thigh pierced, whatever part of his body fortune should seize on, that cheerfully relinquishing. Provided that, with what remained, he might live in honour and renown. And shall it be said that he, born in Pella, a place heretofore mean and ignoble, should be inspired with so high an ambition and thirst of fame, while you, Athenians, etc.? These praises excite the most lively admiration, but the views presented by the orator carry us not, we see, beyond the hero himself, nor ever regard the future advantageous consequences of his valour. The material temper of the Romans, inflamed by continual wars, had raised their esteem of courage so high that, in their language, it was called virtue, by way of excellence and of distinction from all other moral qualities. The Suevi, in the opinion of Tacitus, Tus, dressed their hair with a laudable intent, not for the purpose of loving or being loves, they dawned themselves only for their enemies, and in order to appear more terrible. A sentiment of the historian, which would sound a little oddly in other nations and other ages. The Scythians, according to Herodotus, after scalping their enemies, dressed the skin like leather, and used it as a towel, and whoever had the most of those towels was most esteemed among them. So much had martial bravery in that nation 
as well as in many others, destroyed the sentiments of humanity, a virtue surely much more useful and engaging. It is indeed observable that, among all uncultivated nations, who have not as yet had full experience of the advantages attending beneficence, justice, and the social virtues, courage is the predominant excellence. What is most celebrated by poets, recommended by parents and instructors, and admired by the public in general. The ethics of Homer are, in this particular, very different from those of Fenelon, his elegant imitator, and such as were well suited to an age, when one hero, as remarked by Thucydides, could ask another, without offence, whether he were a robber or not. Such also very lately was the system of ethics which prevailed in many barbarous parts of Ireland. If we may credit Spencer in his judicious account of the state of that kingdom. Footnote from Spencer It is a common use, says he, amongst their gentlemen's sons, that, as soon as they are able to use their weapons, they straight gather to themselves three or four stragglers or kern, with whom wandering a while up and down idly the country, taking only meat, he at last falleth into some bad occasion that shall be offered, which being once made known, he is thenceforth counted a man of worth, in whom there is courage. Of the same class of virtues with courage is that undisturbed philosophical tranquillity, superior to pain, sorrow, anxiety, and each assault of adverse fortune. Conscious of his own virtue, says the philosophers, the sage elevates himself above every accident of life, and securely placed in the temple of wisdom, looks down on inferior mortals engaged in pursuit of honours, riches, reputation, and every frivolous enjoyment. These pretentious, no doubt, when stretched to the utmost, are by far too magnificent for human nature. They carry, however, a grandeur with them, which seizes the spectator, and strikes him with admiration. And the nearer we can approach in practice to this sublime tranquillity and indifference, for we must distinguish it from a stupid insensibility, the more secure enjoyment shall we attain within ourselves, and the more greatness of mind shall we discover to the world. The philosophical tranquillity may, indeed, be considered only as a branch of magnanimity. Who admires not Socrates, his perpetual serenity and contentment, amidst the greatest poverty and domestic vexations, his resolute contempt of riches, and his magnanimous care of preserving liberty, while he refused all assistance from his friends and disciples, and avoided even the dependence of an obligation? Epictetus had not so much as a door to his little house or hovel, and therefore soon lost his iron lamp, the only furniture which he had worth taking. But resolving to disappoint all robbers for the future, he supplied its place with an earthen lamp, of which he very peacefully kept possession ever after. Among the ancients, the heroes in philosophy, as well as those in war and patriotism, have a grandeur and force of sentiment which astonishes our narrow souls, and is rashly rejected as extravagant and supernatural. They, in their turn, I allow, would have had equal reason to consider as romantic and incredible the degree of humanity, clemency, order, tranquillity, and other social virtues to which, in the administration of government, we have attained in modern times, had any one been then able to have made a fair representation of them. Such is the compensation which nature, or rather education, has made in the distribution of excellences and virtues in those different ages. The merit of benevolence, arising from its utility and its tendency to promote the good of mankind, has been already explained, and is, no doubt, the source of a considerable part of that esteem, which is so universally paid to it. But it will also be allowed that the very softness and tenderness of the sentiment, its engaging endearments, its fond expressions, 
its delicate attentions, and all that flow of mutual confidence and regard, which enters into a warm attachment of love and friendship. It will be allowed, I say, that these feelings, being delightful in themselves, are necessarily communicated to the spectators, and melt them into the same fondness and delicacy. The tear naturally starts in our eye on the apprehension of a warm sentiment of this nature. Our breast heaves, our heart is agitated, and every humane tender principle of our frame is set in motion, and gives us the purest and most satisfactory enjoyment. When poets form descriptions of Elysian fields, where the blessed inhabitants stand in no need of each other's assistance, they yet represent them as maintaining a constant intercourse of love and friendship, and soothe our fancy with a pleasing image of these soft and gentle passions. The idea of tender tranquillity in a pastoral Arcadia is agreeable from a like principle, as has been observed above. Who would live amidst perpetual wrangling and scolding and mutual reproaches? The roughness and harshness of these emotions disturb and displease us. We suffer by contagion and sympathy. Nor can we remain indifferent spectators, even though certain that no pernicious consequences would ever follow from such angry passions. As a certain proof that the whole merit of benevolence is not derived from its usefulness, we may observe that in a kind way of blame, we say, a person is too good, when he exceeds his part in society, and carries his attention for others beyond the proper bounds. In like manner, we say, a man is too high-spirited, too intrepid, too indifferent about fortune. Reproaches which, really, at bottom, imply more esteem than many panegyrics. Being accustomed to rate the merit and demerit of characters chiefly by their useful or pernicious tendencies, we cannot forbear applying the epithet of blame when we discover a sentiment which rises to a degree that is hurtful. But it may happen, at the same time, that its noble elevation or its engaging tenderness so seizes the heart as rather to increase our friendship and concern for the person. Footnote. Cheerfulness could scarce admit of blame from its excess. Were it not that dissolute mirth without a proper cause or subject is a sure symptom and characteristic of folly, and on that account disgustful. The amours and attachments of Henry the Fourth of France, during the civil wars of the League, frequently hurt his interest and his cause. But all the young, at least, and amorous, who can sympathize with the tender passions, will allow that this very weakness, for they will readily call it such, chiefly endears that hero, and interests them in his fortunes. The excessive bravery and resolute inflexibility of Charles the Twelfth ruined his own country, and infested all his neighbours, but have such splendour and greatness in their appearance, as strikes us with admiration. And they might, in some degree, be even approved of if they betrayed not sometimes too evident symptoms of madness and disorder. The Athenians pretended to the first invention of agriculture and of laws, and always valued themselves extremely on the benefits thereby procured to the whole race of mankind. They also boasted, and with reason, of their warlike enterprises, particularly against those innumerable fleets and armies of Persians which invaded Greece during the reign of Darius and Xerxes. But though there be no comparison in point of utility between these peaceful and military honours, yet we find that the auditors who have writ such elaborate panegyrics on that famous city have chiefly triumphed in displaying the warlike achievements. Desires, Thucydides, Plato, and Isocrates discover, all of them, the same partiality, which, though condemned by calm reason and reflection, 
appears so natural in the mind of man. It is observable that the great charm of poetry consists in lively pictures of the sublime passions, magnanimity, courage, disdain of fortune, or those of the tender affections, love and friendship, which warm the heart and diffuse over it similar sentiments and emotions. And though all kinds of passion, even the most disagreeable, such as grief and anger, are observed, when excited by poetry, to convey a satisfaction from a mechanism of nature not easy to be explained. Yet those more elevated or softer affections have a peculiar influence, and please from more than one cause or principle. Not to mention that they alone interest us in the fortune of the persons represented, or communicate any esteem and affection for their character. And can it possibly be doubted that this talent itself of poets, to move the passions, this pathetic and sublime of sentiment, is a very considerable merit, and being enhanced by its extreme rarity, may exalt the person possessed of it above every character of the age in which he lives. The prudence, address, steadiness, and benign government of Augustus adorned with all the splendour of his noble birth and imperial crown, render him but an unequal competitor for fame with Virgil, who lays nothing into the opposite scale but the divine beauties of his poetical genius. The very sensibility to these beauties, or a delicacy of taste, is itself a beauty in any character, as conveying the purest, the most durable, and most innocent of all enjoyments. These are some instances of the several species of merit that are valued for the immediate pleasure which they communicate to the person possessed of them. No views of utility or of future beneficial consequences enter into this sentiment of approbation. Yet it is of a kind similar to that other sentiment, which arises from views of a public or private utility. The same social sympathy, we may observe, or fellow-feeling with human happiness or misery, gives rise to both. And this analogy, in all the parts of the present theory, may justly be regarded as a confirmation of it. End of section 11 Recording by Anthony Webster Latin read by Amy Koenig French read by Ruth Golding Section 12 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume Section 8 Of Qualities Immediately Agreeable to Others Footnote It is the nature and, indeed, the definition of virtue that it is a quality of the mind agreeable to or approved of by every one who considers or contemplates it. But some qualities produce pleasure because they are useful to society, or useful or agreeable to the person himself. Others produce it more immediately, which is the case with the class of virtues here considered. As the mutual shocks in society and the oppositions of interest and self-love have constrained mankind to establish the laws of justice in order to preserve the advantages of mutual assistance and protection, in like manner the eternal contraries in company of man's pride and self-conceit have introduced the rules of good manners or politeness in order to facilitate the intercourse of minds and an undisturbed and an undisturbed commerce and conversation. Among well-bred people, a mutual deference is affected, contempt of others disguised, 
authority concealed, attention given to each in his turn, and an easy stream of conversation maintained, without vehemence, without interruption, without eagerness for victory, and without any airs of superiority. These attentions, these attentions and regards are immediately agreeable to others, abstracted from any consideration of utility or beneficial tendencies. They conciliate affection, promote esteem, and extremely enhance the merit of the person who regulates his behaviour by them. Many of the forms of breeding are arbitrary and casual, but the thing expressed by them is still the same. A Spaniard goes out of his own house before his guest, to signify that he leaves him master of all. In other countries the landlord walks out last, as a common mark of deference and regard. But in order to render a man perfect good company, he must have wit and ingenuity as well as good manners. What wit is, it may not be easy to define, but it is easy surely to determine that it is a quality immediately agreeable to others, and communicating, on its first appearance, a lively joy and satisfaction to every one who has any comprehension of it. The most profound metaphysics, indeed, might be employed in explaining the various kinds and species of wit, and many classes of it, which are now received on the sole testimony of taste and sentiment, might, perhaps, be resolved into more general principles. But this is sufficient for our present purpose, that it does affect taste and sentiment, and bestowing an immediate enjoyment is a sure source of approbation and affection. In countries where men pass most of their time in conversation and visits and assemblies, these companionable qualities, so to speak, are of high estimation and form a chief part of personal merit. In countries where men live a more domestic life and either are employed in business or amuse themselves in a narrower circle of acquaintance, the more solid qualities are chiefly regarded. Thus I have observed that among the French, the first questions with regard to a stranger are, is he polite? Has he wit? In our own country, the chief praise bestowed is always that of a good-natured, sensible fellow. In conversation, the lively spirit of dialogue is agreeable, even to those who desire not to have any share in the discourse. Hence the teller of long stories, or the pompous declaimer, is very little approved of but most men desire likewise their turn in the conversation and regard with a very evil eye that loquacity which deprives them of a right they are naturally so jealous of there is a sort of harmless liars frequently to be met with in company who deal much in the marvellous their usual intention is to please and entertain but as men are most delighted with what they conceive to be truth these people mistake extremely the means of pleasing, and incur universal blame. Some indulgence, however, to lying or fiction, is given in humorous stories, because it is there really agreeable and entertaining, and truth is not of any importance. Eloquence, genius of all kinds, even good sense and sound reasoning, when it rises to an eminent degree, and is employed upon subjects of any considerable dignity and nice discernment, all these endowments seem immediately agreeable, and have a merit distinct from their usefulness. Rarity, likewise, which so much enhances the price of everything, must set an additional value on these noble talents of the human mind. Modesty may be understood in different senses, even abstracted from chastity, which has been already treated of. It sometimes means that tenderness and nicety of honour, the apprehension of blame, that dread of intrusion or injury towards others, that pudor, which is the proper guardian of every kind of virtue, and a sure preservative against vice and corruption, but its most usual meaning is when it is opposed to impudence and arrogance, and expresses a diffidence of our own judgment, and a due attention and regard for others. In young men chiefly, 
this quality is a sure sign of good sense, and is also the certain means of augmenting that endowment by preserving their ears open to instruction, and making them still grasp after new attainments. But it has a further charm to every spectator, by flattering every man's vanity, and presenting the appearance of a docile pupil, who receives, with proper attention and respect, every word they utter. Men have, in general, a much greater propensity to overvalue than undervalue themselves, notwithstanding the opinion of Aristotle. Footnote, Ethic ad Nicomachum. This makes us more jealous of the excess on the former side, and causes us to regard, with a peculiar indulgence, all tendency to modesty and self-diffidence, as esteeming the danger less of falling into any vicious extreme of that nature, it is thus in countries where men's bodies are apt to exceed in corpulency. Personal beauty is placed in a much greater degree of slenderness than in countries where that is the most usual defect. Being so often struck with instances of one species of deformity, men think they can never keep at too great a distance from it, and wish always to have a leaning to the opposite side. In like manner, were the door opened to self-praise, and were Montaigne's maxim observed, that one should say as frankly, I have learning, I have courage, beauty, or wit, as it is sure we often think so. Were this the case, I say, every one is sensible that such a flood of impertinence would break in upon us, as would render society wholly intolerable. For this reason custom has established it as a rule in common societies, that men should not indulge themselves in self-praise, or even speak much of themselves, and it is only among intimate friends or people of very manly behaviour that one is allowed to do himself justice. Nobody finds fault with Morris, Prince of Orange, for his reply to one who asked him, whom he esteemed the first general of the age, the Marquis of Spinola, said he, is the second. Though it is observable that the self-praise implied is here better implied than if it had been directly expressed without any cover or disguise. Though it is observable that the self-praise implied is here better implied than if it had been directly expressed without any cover or disguise. He must be a very superficial thinker who imagines that all instances of mutual deference are to be understood in earnest, and that a man would be more estimable for being ignorant of his own merits and accomplishments. A small bias towards modesty, even in the internal sentiment, is favourably regarded, especially in young people, and a strong bias is required in the outward behaviour. But this excludes not a noble pride and spirit, which may openly display itself in its full extent, when one lies under calumny or oppression of any kind. The generous contumacy of Socrates, as Cicero calls it, has been highly celebrated in all ages, and when joined to the usual modesty of his behaviour, forms a shining character. Iphicrates, the Athenian, being accused of betraying the interests of his country, asks his accuser, would you, says he, have, on a like occasion, been guilty of that crime? By no means, replied the other. And can you then imagine, cried the hero, that Iphicrates would be guilty? In short, a generous spirit and self-value, well-founded, decently disguised, and courageously supported under distress and calumny, is a great excellency, and seems to derive its merit from the noble elevation of its sentiment, or its immediate agreeableness to its possessor. In ordinary characters we approve of a bias towards modesty, which is a quality immediately agreeable to others. The vicious excess of the former virtue, namely insolence or haughtiness, is immediately disagreeable to others. The excess of the latter is so to the possessor. Thus are the boundaries of these duties adjusted. A desire of fame, reputation, or a character with others, is so far from being blamable that it seems inseparable from virtue, genius, capacity, and a generous or noble disposition. 
an attention even to trivial matters, in order to please, is also expected and demanded by society, and no one is surprised, if he find a man in company, to observe a greater elegance of dress and more pleasant flow of conversation than when he passes his time at home and with his own family. Wherein, then, consists vanity, which is so justly regarded as a fault or imperfection? It seems to consist chiefly in such an intemperate display of our advantages, honours, and accomplishments, in such an importunate and open demand of praise and admiration, as is offensive to others, and encroaches too far on their secret vanity and ambition. It is besides a sure symptom of the want of true dignity and elevation of mind, which is so great an ornament in any character. For why that impatient desire of applause, as if you were not justly entitled to it, and might not reasonably expect that it would for ever attend you? Why so anxious to inform us of the great company which you have kept, the obliging things which were said to you, the honours, the distinctions which you have met with, as if these were not things of course, and what we could readily, of ourselves, have imagined, without being told of them? Decency, or a proper regard to age, sex, character, and station in the world, may be ranked among the qualities which are immediately agreeable to others, and which by that means acquire praise and approbation. An effeminate behaviour in a man, a rough manner in a woman, these are ugly because unsuitable to each character, and different from the qualities which we expect in the sexes. It is as if a tragedy abounded in comic beauties, or a comedy in tragic. The disproportions hurt the eye, and convey a disagreeable sentiment to the spectators, the source of blame and disapprobation. This is that indecorum, which is explained so much at large by Cicero in his offices. Among the other virtues, we may also give cleanliness a place since it naturally renders us agreeable to others, and is no inconsiderable source of love and affection. No one will deny that a negligence in this particular is a fault, and as faults are nothing but smaller vices, and this fault can have no other origin than the uneasy sensation which it excites in others, we may in this instance, seemingly so trivial, clearly discover the origin of moral distinctions, about which the learned have involved themselves in such mazes of perplexity and error. But besides all the agreeable qualities, the origin of whose beauty we can in some degree explain and account for, there still remains something mysterious and inexplicable, which conveys an immediate satisfaction to the spectator, but how or why or for what reason he cannot pretend to determine. There is a manner, a grace, an ease, a genteelness, and I know not what, which some men possess above others, which is very different from external beauty and comeliness, and which, however, catches our affection almost as suddenly and powerfully. And though this manner be chiefly talked of in the passion between the sexes, where the concealed magic is easily explained, yet surely much of it prevails in all our estimation of characters, and forms no inconsiderable part of personal merit. This class of accomplishments, therefore, must be trusted entirely to the blind but sure testimony of taste and sentiment, and must be considered as a part of ethics, left by nature to baffle all the pride of philosophy, and make her sensible of her narrow boundaries and slender acquisitions. We approve of another, because of his wit, politeness, modesty, decency, or any agreeable quality which he possesses, though he be not of our acquaintance, nor has ever given us any entertainment by means of these accomplishments. The idea which we form of their effect on his acquaintance has an agreeable influence on our imagination and gives us the sentiment of approbation. This principle enters into all the judgments which we form concerning manners and characters. End of part eight. Section thirteen of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. 
an inquiry concerning the principles of morals by david hume section nine conclusion part one it may justly appear surprising that any man in so late an age should find it requisite to prove by elaborate reasoning that personal merit consists altogether in the possession of mental qualities useful or agreeable to the person himself or to others it might be expected that this principle would have occurred even to the first rude unpractised inquirers concerning morals and been received from its own evidence without any argument or disputation whatever is valuable in any kind so naturally classes itself under the division of useful or agreeable the utile or the dolce that it is not easy to imagine why we should ever seek further or consider the question as a matter of nice research or inquiry and as everything useful or agreeable must possess these qualities with regard either to the person himself or to others the complete delineation or description of merit seems to be performed as naturally as a shadow is cast by the sun or an image is reflected upon water if the ground on which the shadow is cast be not broken and uneven nor the surface from which the image is reflected disturbed and confused a just figure is immediately presented without any art or attention and it seems a reasonable presumption that systems and hypotheses have perverted our natural understanding when a theory so simple and obvious could so long have escaped the most elaborate examination but however the case may have fared with philosophy in common life these principles are still implicitly maintained nor is any other topic of praise or blame ever recurred to when we employ any panegyric or satire any applause or censure of human action and behaviour if we observe men in every intercourse of business or pleasure in every discourse and conversation we shall find them nowhere except the schools at any loss upon this subject what so natural for instance as the following dialogue you are very happy we shall suppose one to say addressing himself to another that you have given your daughter to cleanthes he is a man of honour and humanity every one who has any intercourse with him is sure of fair and kind treatment Footnote qualities useful to others i congratulate you too says another on the promising expectations of this son-in-law whose assiduous application to the study of the laws whose quick penetration and early knowledge both of men and business prognosticate the greatest honours and advancement Footnote, qualities useful to the person himself you surprise me replies a third when you talk of cleanthes as a man of business and application i met him lately in a circle of the gayest company and he was the very life and soul of our conversation so much wit with good manners so much gallantry without affectation so much ingenious knowledge so genteelly delivered i have never before observed in any one footnote qualities immediately agreeable to others you would admire him still more says a fourth if you knew him more familiarly that cheerfulness which you might remark in him is not a sudden flash struck out by company it runs through the whole tenor of his life and preserves a perpetual serenity on his countenance and tranquillity in his soul he has met with severe trials misfortunes as well as dangers and by his greatness of mind was still superior to all of them footnote qualities immediately agreeable to the person himself the image gentlemen which you have here delineated of cleanthes cried i is that of accomplished merit each of you has given a stroke of the pencil to his figure and you have unawares exceeded all the pictures drawn by gratian or castiglione a philosopher might select this character as a model of perfect virtue 
and as every quality which is useful or agreeable to ourselves or others is in common life allowed to be a part of personal merit so no other will ever be received where men judge of things by their natural unprejudiced reason without the delusive glosses of superstition and false religion celibacy fasting penance mortification self-denial humility silence solitude and the whole train of monkish virtues for what reason are they everywhere rejected by men of sense but because they serve to no manner of purpose neither advance a man's fortune in the world nor render him a more valuable member of society neither qualify him for the entertainment of company nor increase his power of self-enjoyment we observe on the contrary that they cross all these desirable ends stupefy the understanding and harden the heart obscure the fancy and sour the temper we justly therefore transfer them to the opposite column and place them in the catalogue of vices nor has any superstition force sufficient among men of the world to pervert entirely these natural sentiments a gloomy hare-brained enthusiast after his death may have a place in the calendar but will scarcely ever be admitted when alive into intimacy and in society except by those who are as delirious and dismal as himself it seems a happiness in the present theory that it enters not into that vulgar dispute concerning the degrees of benevolence or self-love which prevail in human nature a dispute which is never likely to have any issue both because men who have taken part are not easily convinced and because the phenomena which can be produced on either side are so dispersed so uncertain and subject to so many interpretations that it is scarcely possible accurately to compare them or draw from them any determinate inference or conclusion it is sufficient for our present purpose if it be allowed what surely without the greatest absurdity cannot be disputed that there is some benevolence however small infused into our bosom some spark of friendship for humankind some particle of the dove kneaded into our frame along with the elements of the wolf and serpent let these generous sentiments be supposed ever so weak let them be insufficient to move even a hand or finger of our body they must still direct the determinations of our mind and where everything else is equal produce a cool preference of what is useful and serviceable to mankind above what is pernicious and dangerous a moral distinction therefore immediately arises a general sentiment of blame and approbation a tendency however faint to the objects of the one and a proportionable aversion to those of the other nor will those reasoners who so earnestly maintain the predominant selfishness of humankind be anywise scandalized at hearing of the weak sentiments of virtue implanted in our nature on the contrary they are found as ready to maintain the one tenet as the other and their spirit of satire for such it appears rather than of corruption naturally gives rise to both opinions which have indeed a great and almost an indissoluble connection together avarice ambition vanity and all passions vulgarly though improperly comprised under the denomination of self-love are here excluded from our theory concerning the origin of morals not because they are too weak but because they have not a proper direction for that purpose the notion of morals implies some sentiment common to all mankind which recommends the same object to general approbation and makes every man or most men agree in the same opinion or decision concerning it it also implies some sentiment so universal and comprehensive as to extend to all mankind and render the actions and conduct even of the persons the most remote an object of applause or censure 
according as they agree or disagree with that rule of right which is established. These two requisite circumstances belong alone to the sentiment of humanity here insisted on. The other passions produce in every breast many strong sentiments of desire and aversion, affection and hatred, but these neither are felt so much in common nor are so comprehensive as to be the foundation of any general system and established theory of blame or approbation. When a man denominates another his enemy, his rival, his antagonist, his adversary, he is understood to speak the language of self-love, and to express sentiments peculiar to himself, and arising from his particular circumstances and situation. But when he bestows on any man the epithets of vicious, or odious, or depraved, he then speaks another language, and expresses sentiments in which he expects all his audience are to concur with him. He must here, therefore, depart from his private and particular situation, and must choose a point of view common to him with others. He must move some universal principle of the human frame, and touch a string to which all mankind have an accord and symphony. If he mean, therefore, to express that this man possesses qualities whose tendency is pernicious to society, he has chosen this common point of view, and has touched the principle of humanity in which every man in some degree concurs. While the human heart is compounded of the same elements as at present, it will never be wholly indifferent to public good, nor entirely unaffected with the tendency of characters and manners. And though this affection of humanity may not generally be esteemed so strong as vanity or ambition, yet being common to all men, it can alone be the foundation of morals, or of any general system of blame or praise. One man's ambition is not another's ambition, nor will the same event or object satisfy both but the humanity of one man is the humanity of every one, and the same object touches this passion in all human creatures. But the sentiments which arise from humanity are not only the same in all human creatures, and produce the same approbation or censure, but they also comprehend all human creatures nor is there any one whose conduct or character is not, by their means, an object to every one of censure or approbation. On the contrary, those other passions, commonly denominated selfish, both produce different sentiments in each individual according to his particular situation, and also contemplate the greater part of mankind with the utmost indifference and unconcern. Whoever has a high regard and esteem for me flatters my vanity. Whoever expresses contempt mortifies and displeases me. But as my name is known but to a small part of mankind, there are few who come within the sphere of this passion, or excite on its account either my affection or disgust. But if you represent a tyrannical, insolent, or barbarous behaviour, in any country or in any age of the world, I soon carry my eye to the pernicious tendency of such a conduct, and feel the sentiment of repugnance and displeasure towards it. No character can be so remote as to be, in this light, wholly indifferent to me. What is beneficial to society or to the person himself must still be preferred and every quality or action of every human being must, by this means, be ranked under some class or denomination expressive of general censure or applause. What more, therefore, can we ask to distinguish the sentiments dependent on humanity from those connected with any other passion, or to satisfy us why the former are the origin of morals, not the latter? Whatever conduct gains my approbation by touching my humanity procures also the applause of all mankind by affecting the same principle in them. 
but what serves my avarice or ambition pleases these passions in me alone and affects not the avarice and ambition of the rest of mankind there is no circumstance of conduct in any man provided it have a beneficial tendency that is not agreeable to my humanity however remote the person but every man so far removed as neither to cross nor serve my avarice and ambition is regarded as wholly indifferent by those passions the distinction therefore between these species of sentiment being so great and evident language must soon be moulded upon it and must invent a peculiar set of terms in order to express those universal sentiments of censure or approbation which arise from humanity or from views of general usefulness and its contrary virtue and vice become then known morals are recognized certain general ideas are framed of human conduct and behavior such measures are expected from men in such situations this action is determined to be conformable to our abstract rule that other contrary and by such universal principles are the particular sentiments of self-love frequently controlled and limited footnote it seems certain both from reason and experience that a rude untaught savage regulates chiefly his love and hatred by the ideas of private utility and injury and has but faint conceptions of a general rule or system of behaviour the man who stands opposite to him in battle he hates heartily not only for the present moment which is almost unavoidable but for ever after nor is he satisfied without the most extreme punishment and vengeance but we accustomed to society and to more enlarged reflections consider that this man is serving his own country and community that any man in the same situation would do the same that we ourselves in like circumstances observe a like conduct that in general human society is best supported on such maxims and by these suppositions and views we correct in some measure our ruder and narrower positions and though much of our friendship and enmity be still regulated by private considerations of benefit and harm we pay at least this homage to general rules which we are accustomed to respect that we commonly pervert our adversary's conduct by imputing malice or injustice to him in order to give vent to those passions which arise from self-love and private interest when the heart is full of rage it never wants pretences of this nature though sometimes as frivolous as those from which horace being almost crushed by the fall of a tree effects to accuse of parricide the first planter of it End of footnote. From instances of popular tumults, seditions, factions, panics, and of all passions which are shared with a multitude, we may learn the influence of society in exciting and supporting any emotion, while the most ungovernable disorders are raised, we find, by that means, from the slightest and most frivolous occasions solon was no very cruel though perhaps an unjust legislator who punished neuters in civil wars and few i believe would in such cases incur the penalty were their affection and discourse allowed sufficient to absolve them no selfishness and scarce any philosophy have their force sufficient to support a total coolness and indifference and he must be more or less than man who kindles not in the common blaze what wonder then that moral sentiments are found of such influence in life though springing from principles which may appear at first sight somewhat small and delicate but these principles we must remark are social and universal they form in a manner the party of humankind against vice or disorder its common enemy and as the benevolent concern for others is diffused in a greater or less degree over all men and is the same in all it occurs more frequently in discourse 
is cherished by society and conversation, and the blame and approbation consequent on it are thereby roused from that lethargy into which they are probably lulled in solitary and uncultivated nature. Other passions, though perhaps originally stronger, yet being selfish and private, are often overpowered by its force, and yield the dominion of our breast to those social and public principles. Another spring of our constitution that brings a great addition of force to moral sentiments is the love of fame, which rules with such uncontrolled authority in all generous minds, and is often the grand object of all their designs and undertakings. By our continual and earnest pursuit of a character, a name, a reputation in the world, we bring our own deportment and conduct frequently in review, and consider how they appear in the eyes of those who approach and regard us. This constant habit of surveying ourselves, as it were, in reflection, keeps alive all the sentiments of right and wrong, and begets in noble natures a certain reverence for themselves as well as others, which is the surest guardian of every virtue. The animal conveniencies and pleasures sink gradually in their value, while every inward beauty and moral grace is studiously acquired, and the mind is accomplished in every perfection which can adorn or embellish a rational creature. Here is the most perfect morality with which we are acquainted. Here is displayed the force of many sympathies. Our moral sentiment is itself a feeling chiefly of that nature, and our regard to a character with others seems to arise only from a care of preserving a character with ourselves. And in order to attain this end, we find it necessary to prop our tottering judgment on the correspondent approbation of mankind. But that we may accommodate matters, and remove, if possible, every difficulty, let us allow all these reasonings to be false. Let us allow that when we resolve the pleasure which arises from views of utility into the sentiments of humanity and sympathy, we have embraced a wrong hypothesis. Let us confess it necessary to find some other explication of that applause which is paid to objects, whether inanimate, animate, or rational, if they have a tendency to promote the welfare and advantage of mankind. However difficult it be to conceive that an object is approved of on account of its tendency to a certain end, while the end itself is totally indifferent, let us swallow this absurdity and consider what are the consequences. The preceding delineation or definition of personal merit must still retain its evidence and authority. It must still be allowed that every quality of the mind which is useful or agreeable to the person himself or to others communicates a pleasure to the spectator, engages his esteem, and is admitted under the honourable denomination of virtue or merit. Are not justice, fidelity, honour, veracity, allegiance, chastity, esteemed solely on account of their tendency to promote the good of society? Is not that tendency inseparable from humanity, benevolence, lenity, generosity, gratitude, moderation, tenderness, friendship, and all the other social virtues? Can it possibly be doubted that industry, discretion, frugality, secrecy, order, perseverance, forethought, judgment, and this whole class of virtues and accomplishments, of which many pages would not contain the catalogue, can it be doubted, I say, that the tendency of these qualities to promote the interest and happiness of their possessor is the sole foundation of their merit? Who can dispute that a mind which supports a perpetual serenity and cheerfulness, a noble dignity and undaunted spirit, a tender affection and good will to all around, as it has more enjoyment within itself, is also a more animating and rejoicing spectacle than if dejected with melancholy, tormented with anxiety, 
irritated with rage or sunk into the most abject baseness and degeneracy and as to the qualities immediately agreeable to others they speak sufficiently for themselves and he must be unhappy indeed either in his own temper or in his situation and company who has not perceived the charms of a facetious wit or flowing affability of a delicate modesty or decent genteelness of address and manner i am sensible that nothing can be more unphilosophical than to be positive or dogmatical on any subject and that even if excessive scepticism could be maintained it would not be more destructive to all just reasoning and inquiry i am convinced that where men are the most sure and arrogant they are commonly the most mistaken and have there given reins to passion without that proper deliberation and suspense which can alone secure them from the grossest absurdities yet i must confess that this enumeration puts the matter in so strong a light that i cannot at present be more assured of any truth which i learn from reasoning and argument than that personal merit consists entirely in the usefulness or agreeableness of qualities to the person himself possessed of them or to others who have any intercourse with him but when i reflect that though the bulk and figure of the earth have been measured and delineated though the motions of the tides have been accounted for the order and economy of the heavenly bodies subjected to their proper laws and infinite itself reduced to calculation yet men still dispute concerning the foundation of their moral duties when i reflect on this i say i fall back into diffidence and scepticism and suspect that an hypothesis so obvious had it been a true one would long ere now have been received by the unanimous suffrage and consent of mankind end of section thirteen section fourteen of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org an inquiry concerning the principles of morals by david hume section nine conclusion part two having explained the moral approbation attending merit or virtue there remains nothing but briefly to consider our interested obligation to it and to inquire whether every man who has any regard to his own happiness and welfare will not best find his account in the practice of every moral duty if this can be clearly ascertained from the foregoing theory we shall have the satisfaction to reflect that we have advanced principles which not only it is hoped will stand the test of reasoning and inquiry but may contribute to the amendment of men's lives and their improvement in morality and social virtue and though the philosophical truth of any proposition by no means depends on its tendency to promote the interests of society yet a man has but a bad grace who delivers a theory however true which he must confess leads to a practice dangerous and pernicious why rake into those corners of nature which spread a nuisance all around why dig up the pestilence from the pit in which it is buried the ingenuity of your researches may be admired but your systems will be detested and mankind will agree if they cannot refute them to sink them at least in eternal silence and oblivion truths which are pernicious to society if any such there be will yield to errors which are salutary and advantageous but what philosophical truths can be more advantageous to society than those here delivered which represent virtue in all her genuine and most engaging charms and makes us approach her with ease familiarity and affection the dismal dress falls off with which many divines and some philosophers have covered her 
and nothing appears but gentleness, humanity, beneficence, affability, nay, even at proper intervals, play, frolic, and gaiety. She talks not of useless austerities and rigours, suffering and self-denial. She declares that her sole purpose is to make her votaries and all mankind, during every instant of their existence, if possible, cheerful and happy nor does she ever willingly part with any pleasure but in hopes of ample compensation in some other period of their lives the sole trouble which she demands is that of just calculation and a steady preference of the greater happiness and if any austere pretenders approach her enemies to joy and pleasure she either rejects them as hypocrites and deceivers or if she admit them in her train they are ranked, however, among the least favoured of her votaries. And indeed, to drop all figurative expression, what hopes can we ever have of engaging mankind to a practice which we confess full of austerity and rigour? Or what theory of morals can ever serve any useful purpose, unless it can show by a particular detail that all the duties which it recommends are also the true interest of each individual? The peculiar advantage of the foregoing system seems to be that it furnishes proper mediums for that purpose. That the virtues which are immediately useful or agreeable to the person possessed of them are desirable in a view to self-interest, it would surely be superfluous to prove. Moralists indeed may spare themselves all the pains which they often take in recommending these duties. To what purpose collect arguments to evince that temperance is advantageous and the excesses of pleasure hurtful, when it appears that these excesses are only denominated such because they are hurtful, and that if the unlimited use of strong liquors, for instance, no more impaired health or the faculties of mind and body than the use of air or water, it would not be a whit more vicious or blamable? it seems equally superfluous to prove that the companionable virtues of good manners and wit decency and genteelness are more desirable than the contrary qualities vanity alone without any other consideration is a sufficient motive to make us wish for the possession of these accomplishments no man was ever willingly deficient in this particular all our failures here proceed from bad education want of capacity or a perverse and unpliable disposition would you have your company coveted admired followed rather than hated despised avoided can any one seriously deliberate in the case as no enjoyment is sincere without some reference to company and society so no society can be agreeable or even tolerable where a man feels his presence unwelcome and discovers all around him symptoms of disgust and aversion but why in the greater society or confederacy of mankind should not the case be the same as in particular clubs and companies why is it more doubtful that the enlarged virtues of humanity generosity beneficence are desirable with a view of happiness and self-interest than the limited endowments of ingenuity and politeness are we apprehensive lest those social affections interfere in a greater and more immediate degree than any other pursuits with private utility and cannot be gratified without some important sacrifice of honour and advantage if so we are but ill instructed in the nature of the human passions and are more influenced by verbal distinctions than by real differences whatever contradiction may vulgarly be supposed between the selfish and social sentiments or dispositions they are really no more opposite than selfish and ambitious selfish and revengeful selfish and vain it is requisite that there be an original propensity of some kind in order to be a basis to self-love by giving a relish to the objects of its pursuit and none more fit for this purpose than benevolence or humanity the goods of fortune are spent in one gratification or another 
the miser who accumulates his annual income and lends it out at interest has really spent it in the gratification of his avarice and it would be difficult to show why a man is more a loser by a generous action than by any other method of expense since the utmost which he can attain by the most elaborate selfishness is the indulgence of some affection now if life without passion must be altogether insipid and tiresome let a man suppose that he has full power of modelling his own disposition and let him deliberate what appetite or desire he would choose for the foundation of his happiness and enjoyment every affection he would observe when gratified by success gives a satisfaction proportioned to its force and violence but besides this advantage common to all the immediate feeling of benevolence and friendship humanity and kindness is sweet smooth tender and agreeable independent of all fortune and accidents these virtues are besides attended with a pleasing consciousness or remembrance and keep us in humour with ourselves as well as others while we retain the agreeable reflection of having done our part towards mankind and society and though all men show a jealousy of our success in the pursuits of avarice and ambition yet are we almost sure of their good will and good wishes so long as we persevere in the paths of virtue and employ ourselves in the execution of generous plans and purposes what other passion is there where we shall find so many advantages united an agreeable sentiment a pleasing consciousness a good reputation but of these truths we may observe men are of themselves pretty much convinced nor are they deficient in their duty to society because they would not wish to be generous friendly and humane but because they do not feel themselves such treating vice with the greatest candour and making it all possible concessions we must acknowledge that there is not in any instance the smallest pretext for giving it the preference above virtue with a view to self-interest except perhaps in the case of justice where a man taking things in a certain light may often seem to be a loser by his integrity and though it is allowed that without a regard to property no society could subsist yet according to the imperfect way in which human affairs are conducted a sensible knave in particular incidents may think that an act of iniquity or infidelity will make a considerable addition to his fortune without causing any considerable breach in the social union and confederacy that honesty is the best policy may be a good general rule but is liable to many exceptions and he it may perhaps be thought conducts himself with most wisdom who observes the general rule and takes advantage of all the exceptions i must confess that if a man think that this reasoning much requires an answer it would be a little difficult to find any which will to him appear satisfactory and convincing if his heart rebel not against such pernicious maxims if he feel no reluctance to the thoughts of villainy or baseness he has indeed lost a considerable motive to virtue and we may expect that this practice will be answerable to his speculation but in all ingenuous natures the antipathy to treachery and roguery is too strong to be counterbalanced by any views of profit or pecuniary advantage inward peace of mind consciousness of integrity a satisfactory review of our own conduct these are circumstances very requisite to happiness and will be cherished and cultivated by every honest man who feels the importance of them such a one has besides the frequent satisfaction of seeing knaves with all their pretended cunning and abilities betrayed by their own maxims and while they purpose to cheat with moderation and secrecy a tempting incident occurs nature is frail and they give in to the snare whence they can never extricate themselves without a total loss of reputation and the forfeiture of all future trust and confidence with mankind but were they ever so secret and successful 
the honest man if he has any tincture of philosophy or even common observation and reflection will discover that they themselves are in the end the greatest dupes and have sacrificed the invaluable enjoyment of a character with themselves at least for the acquisition of worthless toys and gewgaws how little is requisite to supply the necessities of nature and in a view to pleasure what comparison between the unbought satisfaction of conversation society study even health and the common beauties of nature but above all the peaceful reflection on one's own conduct what comparison i say between these and the feverish empty amusements of luxury and expense these natural pleasures indeed are really without price both because they are below all price in their attainment and above it in their enjoyment end of section fourteen section fifteen of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume. Appendix 1. Concerning Moral Sentiment. If the foregoing hypothesis be received, it will now be easy for us to determine the question first started. Footnote, section 1. Concerning the general principles of morals. And though we postponed the decision of that question, lest it should then involve us in intricate speculations which are unfit for moral discourses we may resume it at present and examine how far either reason or sentiment enters into all decisions of praise or censure one principal foundation of moral praise being supposed to lie in the usefulness of any quality or action it is evident that reason must enter for a considerable share in all decisions of this kind since nothing but that faculty can instruct us in the tendency of qualities and actions and point out their beneficial consequences to society and to their possessor in many cases this is an affair liable to great controversy doubts may arise opposite interests may occur and a preference must be given to one side from very nice views and a small overbalance of utility this is particularly remarkable in questions with regard to justice, as is, indeed, natural to suppose, from the species of utility which attends this virtue. Footnote. See Appendix 2. End of footnote. Were every single instance of justice, like that of benevolence, useful to society, this would be a more simple state of the case, and seldom liable to great controversy but as single instances of justice are often pernicious in their first and immediate tendency and as the advantage to society results only from the observance of the general rule and from the concurrence and combination of several persons in the same equitable conduct the case here becomes more intricate and involved the various circumstances of society the various consequences of any practice the various interests which may be proposed these on many occasions are doubtful and subject to great discussion and inquiry the object of municipal laws is to fix all the questions with regard to justice the debates of civilians the reflections of politicians the precedents of history and public records are all directed to the same purpose and a very accurate reason or judgment is often requisite to give the true determination amidst such intricate doubts arising from obscure or opposite utilities but though reason when fully assisted and improved be sufficient to instruct us in the pernicious or useful tendency of qualities and actions it is not alone sufficient to produce any moral blame or approbation utility is only a tendency to a certain end and were the end totally indifferent to us we should feel the same indifference towards the means it is requisite a sentiment should here display itself in order to give a preference to the useful above the pernicious tendencies this sentiment can be no other than a feeling for the happiness of mankind and a resentment of their misery 
since these are the different ends which virtue and vice have a tendency to promote. Here, therefore, reason instructs us in the several tendencies of actions, and humanity makes a distinction in favour of those which are useful and beneficial. The partition between the faculties of understanding and sentiment, in all moral decisions, seems clear from the preceding hypothesis. But I shall suppose that hypothesis false. It will then be requisite to look out for some other theory that may be satisfactory, and I dare venture to affirm that none such will ever be found, so long as we suppose reason to be the sole source of morals. To prove this, it will be proper to weigh the five following considerations. 1. It is easy for a false hypothesis to maintain some appearance of truth, while it keeps wholly in generals, makes use of undefined terms, and employs comparisons instead of instances. This is particularly remarkable in that philosophy which ascribes the discernment of all moral distinctions to reason alone, without the concurrence of sentiment. It is impossible that, in any particular instance, this hypothesis can so much as be rendered intelligible, whatever specious figure it may make in general declamations and discourses. Examine the crime of ingratitude, for instance which has place wherever we observe good will expressed and known together with good offices performed on the one side and a return of ill will or indifference with ill offices or neglect on the other anatomize all these circumstances and examine by your reason alone in what consists the demerit or blame you never will come to any issue or conclusion Reason judges either of matter of fact or of relations. Inquire then, first, where is that matter of fact which we here call crime? Point it out. Determine the time of its existence. Describe its essence or nature. Explain the sense or faculty to which it discovers itself. It resides in the mind of the person who is ungrateful. He must, therefore, feel it, and be conscious of it. But nothing is there except the passion of ill-will or absolute indifference. You cannot say that these, of themselves, always and in all circumstances, are crimes. No, they are only crimes when directed towards persons who have before expressed and displayed good-will towards us. Consequently, we may infer that the crime of ingratitude is not any particular individual fact, but arises from a complication of circumstances, which, being presented to the spectator, excites the sentiment of blame by the particular structure and fabric of his mind. This representation, you say, is false. Crime, indeed, consists not in a particular fact, of whose reality we are assured by reason, but it consists in certain moral relations, discovered by reason, in the same manner as we discover by reason the truths of geometry or algebra. But what are the relations, I ask, of which you here talk? In the case stated above, I see first good will and good offices in one person, then ill will and ill offices in the other. Between these there is a relation of contrariety. Does the crime consist in that relation? But suppose a person bore me ill will, or did me ill offices, and I in return were indifferent towards him, or did him good offices. Here is the same relation of contrariety, and yet my conduct is often highly laudable. Twist and turn this matter as much as you will, you can never rest the morality on relation, but must have recourse to the decisions of sentiment. When it is affirmed that two and three are equal to the half of ten, this relation of equality I understand perfectly. I conceive that if ten be divided into two parts, of which one has as many units as the other, and if any of these parts be compared to two added to three, it will contain as many units as that compound number. But when you draw thence a comparison to moral relations, I own that I am altogether at a loss to understand you. A moral action, a crime, such as ingratitude, is a complicated object. 
Does the morality consist in the relation of its parts to each other? How? After what manner? Specify the relation. Be more particular and explicit in your propositions, and you will easily see their falsehood. No, say you. The morality consists in the relation of actions to the rule of right, and they are denominated good or ill according as they agree or disagree with it. What then is this rule of right? In what does it consist? How is it determined? By reason, you say, which examines the moral relations of actions. So that moral relations are determined by the comparison of action to a rule, and the rule is determined by considering the moral relations of objects. Is this not fine reasoning? All this is metaphysics, you cry. That is enough. There needs nothing more to give a strong presumption of falsehood. Yes, reply I, here are metaphysics surely, but they are all on your side who advance an abstruse hypothesis, which can never be made intelligible, nor quadrate with any particular instance or illustration. The hypothesis which we embrace is plain. It maintains that morality is determined by sentiment. It gives virtue to be whatever mental action or quality gives to a spectator the pleasing sentiment of approbation and vice the contrary. We then proceed to examine a plain matter of fact, to wit, what actions have this influence. We consider all the circumstances in which these actions agree, and thence endeavour to extract some general observations with regard to these sentiments. If you call this metaphysics, and find anything abstruse here, you need only conclude that your turn of mind is not suited to the moral sciences. 2. When a man at any time deliberates concerning his own conduct, as whether he had better in a particular emergence assist a brother or a benefactor, he must consider these separate relations with all the circumstances and situations of the persons in order to determine the superior duty and obligation. And in order to determine the proportion of lines in any triangle, it is necessary to examine the nature of that figure and the relation which its several parts bear to each other. But notwithstanding this appearing similarity in the two cases, there is at bottom an extreme difference between them. A speculative reasoner concerning triangles or circles considers the several known and given relations of the parts of these figures, and thence infers some unknown relation which is dependent on the former. But in moral deliberations we must be acquainted beforehand with all the objects, and all their relations to each other, and from a comparison of the whole fix our choice or approbation. No new fact to be ascertained, no new relation to be discovered. All the circumstances of the case are supposed to be laid before us ere we can fix any sentence of blame or approbation. If any material circumstance be yet unknown or doubtful, we must first employ our inquiry or intellectual faculties to assure us of it, and must suspend for a time all moral decision or sentiment. While we are ignorant whether a man were aggressor or not, how can we determine whether the person who killed him be criminal or innocent? But after every circumstance, every relation is known, the understanding has no further room to operate, nor any object on which it could employ itself. The approbation or blame which then ensues cannot be the work of the judgment, but of the heart, and is not a speculative proposition or affirmation, but an active feeling or sentiment. In the disquisitions of the understanding, from known circumstances and relations, we infer some new and unknown. In moral decisions, all the circumstances and relations must be previously known, and the mind, from the contemplation of the whole, feels some new impression or affection, or disgust, esteem or contempt, approbation or blame. Hence the great difference between a mistake of fact and one of right and hence the reason why the one is commonly criminal and not the other. When Oedipus killed Laius, he was ignorant of the relation, and from circumstances innocent and involuntary formed erroneous opinions concerning the action which he committed. But when Nero killed Agrippina, all the relations between himself and the person, 
and all the circumstances of the fact were previously known to him but the motive of revenge or fear or interest prevailed in his savage heart over the sentiments of duty and humanity and when we express that detestation against him to which he himself in a little time became insensible it is not that we see any relations of which he was ignorant but that for the rectitude of our disposition we feel sentiments against which he was hardened from flattery and a long perseverance in the most enormous crimes in these sentiments then not in a discovery of relations of any kind do all moral determinations consist before we can pretend to form any decision of this kind, everything must be known and ascertained on the side of the object or action. Nothing remains but to feel, on our part, some sentiment of blame or approbation whence we pronounce the action criminal or virtuous. 3. This doctrine will become still more evident if we compare moral beauty with natural, to which in many particulars it bears so near a resemblance. It is on the proportion, relation, and position of parts that all natural beauty depends. But it would be absurd thence to infer that the perception of beauty, like that of truth in geometrical problems, consists wholly in the perception of relations, and was performed entirely by the understanding or intellectual faculties. In all the sciences, our mind from the known relations investigates the unknown, but in all decisions of taste or external beauty, all the relations are beforehand obvious to the eye, and we thence proceed to feel a sentiment of complacency or disgust according to the nature of the object and disposition of our organs. Euclid has fully explained all the qualities of the circle, but has not in any proposition said a word of its beauty. The reason is evident. The beauty is not a quality of the circle. It lies not in any part of the line, whose parts are equally distant from a common centre. It is only the effect which that figure produces upon the mind, whose peculiar fabric of structure renders it susceptible of such sentiments. In vain would you look for it in the circle, or seek it, either by your senses, or by mathematical reasoning, in all the properties of that figure. Attend to Palladio and Perrault, while they explain all the parts and proportions of a pillar. They talk of the cornice and frieze and base and entablature and shaft and architrave, and give the description and position of each of these members. But should you ask the description and position of its beauty, they would readily reply that the beauty is not in any of the parts or members of a pillar, but results from the whole when that complicated figure is presented to an intelligent mind susceptible to those finer sensations. Till such a spectator appear, there is nothing but a figure of such particular dimensions and proportions. From his sentiments alone arise its elegance and beauty. Again, attend to Cicero, while he paints the crimes of a Verres or a Catiline. You must acknowledge that the moral turpitude results, in the same manner, from the contemplation of the whole, when presented to a being whose organs have such a particular structure and formation. The orator may paint rage, insolence, barbarity on the one side, meekness, suffering, sorrow, innocence on the other. But if you feel no indignation or compassion arise in you from this complication of circumstances, you would in vain ask him, in what consists the crime or villainy which he so vehemently exclaims against? At what time, or on what subject, it first began to exist? And what has a few months afterwards become of it, when every disposition and thought of all the actors is totally altered or annihilated? No satisfactory answer can be given to any of these questions, upon the abstract hypothesis of morals, and we must at last acknowledge that the crime or immorality is no particular fact or relation which can be the object of the understanding, but arises entirely from the sentiment of disapprobation, which, by the structure of human nature, we unavoidably feel on the apprehension of barbarity or treachery. 4. Inanimate objects may bear to each other all the same relations which we observe in moral agents, though the former can never be the object of love or hatred, nor are consequently susceptible of merit or iniquity. A young tree, which overtops and destroys its parent, 
stands in all the same relations which Nero, when he murdered Agrippina, and if morality consisted merely in relations, would no doubt be equally criminal. 5. It appears evident that the ultimate ends of human actions can never, in any case, be accounted for by reason, but recommend themselves entirely to the sentiments and affections of mankind, without any dependence on the intellectual faculties. Ask a man why he uses exercise, he will answer, because he desires to keep his health. If you then inquire why he desires health, he will readily reply, because sickness is painful. If you push your inquiries farther, and desire a reason why he hates pain, it is impossible he can ever give any. This is an ultimate end, and is never referred to any other object. Perhaps to your second question, why he desires health, he may also reply, it is necessary for the exercise of his calling. If you ask, why he is anxious on that head, he will answer, because he desires to get money. If you demand why, it is the instrument of pleasure, says he. And beyond this, it is an absurdity to ask for a reason. It is impossible there can be a progress in infinitum, and that one thing can always be a reason why another is desired. Something must be desirable on its own account, and because of its immediate accord or agreement with human sentiment and affection. Now, as virtue is an end, and is desirable on its own account, without fee and reward, merely for the immediate satisfaction which it conveys, it is requisite that there should be some sentiment which it touches, some internal taste or feeling, or whatever you may please to call it, which distinguishes moral good and evil, and which embraces the one and rejects the other. Thus the distinct boundaries and offices of reason and of taste are easily ascertained. The former conveys the knowledge of truth and falsehood. The latter gives the sentiment of beauty and deformity, vice and virtue. The one discovers objects as they really stand in nature, without addition and diminution. The other has a productive faculty, and gilding or staining all natural objects with the colours, borrowed from internal sentiment, raises in a manner a new creation. Reason, being cool and disengaged, is no motive to action, and directs only the impulse received from appetite or inclination, by showing us the means of attaining happiness or avoiding misery. Taste, as it gives pleasure or pain, and thereby constitutes happiness or misery, becomes a motive to action, and is the first spring or impulse to desire and volition. From circumstances and relations, known or supposed, the former leads us to the discovery of the concealed and unknown, after all circumstances and relations are laid before us. The latter makes us feel from the whole a new sentiment of blame or approbation. The standard of the one, being founded on the nature of things, is eternal and inflexible, even by the will of the Supreme Being. The standard of the other, arising from the eternal frame and constitution of animals, is ultimately derived from that supreme will, which bestowed on each being its peculiar nature, and arranged the several classes and orders of existence. End of Appendix 1 End of Section 15「Section 16 of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Webster. An Enquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume Section 16 Appendix 2 Of Self-Love There is a principle supposed to prevail among many which is utterly incompatible with all virtue or moral sentiment and as it can proceed from nothing but the most depraved disposition, so in its turn it tends still further to encourage that depravity. 
this principle is that all benevolence is mere hypocrisy. Friendship a cheat, public spirit a farce, fidelity a snare to procure trust and confidence, and that while all of us at bottom pursue only our private interest, we wear these fair disguises in order to put others off their guard and expose them the more to our wiles and machinations. What heart one must be possessed of who possesses such principles, and who feels no internal sentiment that belies so pernicious a theory, it is easy to imagine. And also what degree of affection and benevolence he can bear to a species whom he represents under such odious colours, and supposes so little susceptible of gratitude or any return of affection. Or if we should not ascribe these principles wholly to a corrupted heart, we must at least account for them from the most careless and precipitate examination. Superficial reasoners, indeed, observing many false pretenses among mankind, and feeling, perhaps, no very strong restraint in their own disposition, might draw a general and a hasty conclusion that all is equally corrupted, and that men, different from all other animals, and indeed from all other species of existence, admit of no degrees of good or bad, but are, in every instance, the same creatures under different disguises and appearances. There is another principle, somewhat resembling the former, which has been much insisted on by philosophers, and has been the foundation of many a system, that, whatever affection one may feel, or imagine he feels for others, no passion is, or can be, disinterested. That the most generous friendship, however sincere, is a modification of self-love, and that, even unknown to ourselves, we seek only our own gratification, while we appear the most deeply engaged in schemes for the liberty and happiness of mankind. By a turn of imagination, by a refinement of reflection, by an enthusiasm of passion, we seem to take part in the interests of others, and imagine ourselves divested of all selfish considerations. But, at bottom, the most generous patriot, and most niggardly miser, the bravest hero, and most abject coward, have, in every action, an equal regard to their own happiness and welfare. Whoever concludes from the seeming tendency of this opinion, that those who make profession of it cannot possibly feel the true sentiments of benevolence, or have any regard for genuine virtue, will often find himself, in practice, very much mistaken. Probity and honour were no strangers to Epicurus and his sect. Atticus and Horace seem to have enjoyed from nature, and cultivated by reflection, as generous and friendly dispositions as any disciple of the austerer schools. And among the modern, Hobbes and Locke, who maintained the selfish system of morals, lived irreproachable lives. Though the former lay not under any restraint of religion which might supply the defects of his philosophy, An Epicurean or a Hobbist readily allows that there is such a thing as a friendship in the world, without hypocrisy or disguise, though he may attempt, by a philosophical chemistry, to resolve the elements of this passion, if I may so speak, into those of another, and explain every affection to be self-love, twisted and moulded, by a particular turn of imagination, into a variety of appearances. But as the same turn of imagination prevails not in every man, 
nor gives the same direction to the original passion. This is sufficient, even according to the selfish system, to make the widest difference in human characters, and denominate one man virtuous and humane, another vicious and meanly interested. I esteem the man whose self-love, by whatever means, is so directed as to give him a concern for others, and to render him serviceable to society. As I hate or despise him, who has no regard to anything beyond his own gratifications and enjoyments. In vain you would suggest that these characters, though seemingly opposite, are at bottom the same, and that a very inconsiderable turn of thought forms the whole difference between them. Each character, notwithstanding these inconsiderable differences, appears to me, in practice, pretty durable and untransmutable. And I find not in this more than in other subjects that the natural sentiments arising from the general appearances of things are easily destroyed by subtile reflections concerning the minute origin of these appearances. Does not the lively, cheerful colour of a countenance inspire me with complacency and pleasure, even though I learn from philosophy that all difference of complexion arises from the most minute differences of thickness in the most minute parts of the skin, by means of which a superficies is qualified to reflect one of the original colours of light and absorb the others. But though the question concerning the universal or partial selfishness of man be not so material as is usually imagined to morality and practice, it is certainly of consequence in the speculative science of human nature, and is a proper object of curiosity and inquiry. It may not, therefore, be unsuitable in this place to bestow a few reflections upon it. Footnote. Benevolence naturally divides into two kinds, the general and the particular. The first is, where we have no friendship or connection or esteem for the person, but feel only a general sympathy with him, or a compassion for his pains, and a congratulation with his pleasures. The other species of benevolence is founded on an opinion of virtue, on services done us, or on some particular connections. Both these sentiments must be allowed real in human nature, but whether they will resolve into some nice considerations of self-love is a question more curious than important. The former sentiment, to wit, that of general benevolence, or humanity, or sympathy, we shall have occasion frequently to treat of in the course of this inquiry, and I assume it as real from general experience, without any other proof. The most obvious objection to the selfish hypothesis is that, as it is contrary to common feeling and our most unprejudiced notions, there is required the highest stretch of philosophy to establish so extraordinary a paradox. To the most careless observer there appear to be such dispositions as benevolence and generosity, such affections as love, friendship, compassion, gratitude. These sentiments have their causes, effects, objects and operations marked by common language and observation, and plainly distinguished from those of the selfish passions. And as this is the obvious appearance of things, it must be admitted, till some hypothesis be discovered, which by penetrating deeper into human nature may prove the former affections to be nothing but modifications of the latter. 
All attempts of this kind have hitherto proved fruitless, and seem to have proceeded entirely from that love of simplicity, which has been the source of much false reasoning in philosophy. I shall not here enter into any detail on the present subject. Many able philosophers have shown the insufficiency of these systems, and I shall take for granted what, I believe, the smallest reflection will make evident to every impartial enquirer. But the nature of the subject furnishes the strongest presumption that no better system will ever, for the future, be invented in order to account for the origin of the benevolent from the selfish affections, and reduce all the various emotions of the human mind to a perfect simplicity. The case is not the same in this species of philosophy as in physics. Many an hypothesis in nature, contrary to first appearances, has been found, on more accurate scrutiny, solid and satisfactory. Instances of this kind are so frequent that a judicious as well as witty philosopher has ventured to affirm, if there be more than one way in which any phenomenon may be produced, that there is general presumption for its arising from the causes which are the least obvious and familiar. But the presumption always lies on the other side, in all inquiries concerning the origin of our passions, and of the internal operations of the human mind. The simplest and most obvious cause which can there be assigned for any phenomenon is probably the true one. When a philosopher, in the explication of his system, is obliged to have recourse to some very intricate and refined reflections, and to suppose them essential to the production of any passion or emotion, we have reason to be extremely on our guard against so fallacious an hypothesis. The affections are not susceptible of any impression from the refinements of reason or imagination, and it is always found that a vigorous exertion of the latter faculties, necessarily, from the narrow capacity of the human mind, destroys all activity in the former. Our predominant motive or intention is, indeed, frequently concealed from ourselves, when it is mingled and confounded with other motives which the mind, from vanity or self-conceit, is desirous of supposing more prevalent. But there is no instance that a concealment of this nature has ever arisen from the abstruseness and intricacy of the motive. A man that has lost a friend and patron may flatter himself that all his grief arises from generous sentiments, without any mixture of narrow or interested considerations. But a man that grieves for a valuable friend, who needed his patronage and protection, how can we suppose that his passionate tenderness arises from some metaphysical regards to a self-interest, which has no foundation or reality? We may as well imagine that minute wheels and springs, like those of a watch, give motion to a loaded wagon, as account for the origin of passion from such abstruse reflections. Animals are found susceptible of kindness, both to their own species and to ours, nor is there, in this case, the least suspicion of disguise or artifice. Shall we account for all their sentiments, too, from refined deductions of self-interest? Or if we admit a disinterested benevolence in the inferior species, by what rule of analogy can we refuse it in the superior? 
Love between the sexes begets a complacency and good will, very distinct from the gratification of an appetite. Tenderness to their offspring, in all sensible beings, is commonly able alone to counterbalance the strongest motives of self-love, and has no manner of dependence on that affection. What interest can a fond mother have in view, who loses her health by assiduous attendance on her sick child, and afterwards languishes and dies of grief, when freed, by its death, from the slavery of that attendance? Is gratitude no affection of the human breast, or is that a word merely without any meaning or reality? Have we no satisfaction in one man's company above another's, and no desire of the welfare of our friend, even though absence or death should prevent us from all participation in it? Or what is it commonly that gives us any participation in it, even while alive and present, but our affection and regard to him? These and a thousand other instances are marks of a general benevolence in human nature, where no real interest binds us to the object. And how an imaginary interest known and avowed for such can be the origin of any passion or emotion seems difficult to explain. No satisfactory hypothesis of this kind has yet been discovered, nor is there the smallest probability that the future industry of men will ever be attended with more favourable success. But farther, if we consider rightly of the matter, we shall find that the hypothesis which allows of a disinterested benevolence, distinct from self-love, has really more simplicity in it and is more conformable to the analogy of nature than that which pretends to resolve all friendship and humanity into this latter principle. There are bodily wants or appetites acknowledged by every one, which necessarily precede all sensual enjoyment, and carry us directly to seek possession of the object. Thus hunger and thirst have eating and drinking for their end. And from the gratification of these primary appetites arises a pleasure which may become the object of another species of desire or inclination that is secondary and interested. In the same manner there are mental passions by which we are impelled immediately to seek particular objects, such as fame or power, or vengeance without any regard to interest. And when these objects are attained, a pleasing enjoyment ensues, as the consequence of our indulged affections. Nature must, by the internal frame and constitution of the mind, give an original propensity to fame, ere we can reap any pleasure from that acquisition, or pursue it from motives of self-love, and desire of happiness. If I have no vanity, I take no delight in praise. If I be void of ambition, power gives me no enjoyment. If I be not angry, the punishment of an adversary is totally indifferent to me. In all these cases, there is a passion which points immediately to the object and constitutes it our good or happiness. As there are other secondary passions which afterwards arise, and pursue it as a part of our happiness, when once it is constituted such by our original affections. Were there no appetite of any kind antecedent to self-love, that propensity could scarcely ever exert itself because we should, in that case, have felt few and slender pains or pleasures, 
and have little misery or happiness to avoid or to pursue. Now, where is the difficulty in conceiving that this may likewise be the case with benevolence and friendship, and that, from the original frame of our temper, we may feel a desire of another's happiness or good, which, by means of that affection, becomes our own good, and is afterwards pursued from the combined motives of benevolence and self-enjoyments. Who sees not that vengeance, from the force alone of passion, may be so eagerly pursued as to make us knowingly neglect every consideration of ease, interest, or safety? And like some vindictive animals, infuse our very souls into the wounds we give an enemy. And what a malignant philosophy must it be that will not allow to humanity and friendship the same privileges which are undisputably granted to the darker passions of enmity and resentment? Such a philosophy is more like a satire than a true delineation or description of human nature and may be a good foundation for paradoxical wit and raillery, but is a very bad one for any serious argument or reasoning. End of section 16 Recording by Anthony Webster Section 17 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume. Appendix 3. Some Further Considerations with Regard to Justice. The intention of this appendix is to give some more particular explication of the origin and nature of justice, and to mark some differences between it and the other virtues. The social virtues of humanity and benevolence exert their influence immediately by a direct tendency or instinct, which chiefly keeps in view the simple object, moving the affections and comprehends not any scheme or system nor the consequences resulting from the concurrence imitation or example of others a parent flies to the relief of his child transported by that natural sympathy which actuates him and which affords no leisure to reflect on the sentiments or conduct of the rest of mankind in like circumstances a generous man chiefly embraces an opportunity of serving his friend because he then feels himself under the dominion of the beneficent affections. Nor is he concerned whether any other person in the universe were ever before actuated by such noble motives, or will ever afterwards prove their influence. In all these cases, the social passions have in view a single individual object, and pursue the safety or happiness alone of the person loved and esteemed. With this they are satisfied, in this they acquiesce. And as the good, resulting from their benign influence, is in itself complete and entire, it also excites the moral sentiment of approbation, without any reflection on farther consequences, and without any more enlarged views of the concurrence or imitation of the other members of society. On the contrary, were the generous friend or disinterested patriot to stand alone in the practice of beneficence, this would rather enhance his value in our eyes and join the praise of rarity and novelty to his other more exalted merits the case is not the same with the social virtues of justice and fidelity they are highly useful or indeed absolutely necessary to the well-being of mankind but the benefit resulting from them is not the consequence of every individual single act but arises from the whole scheme or system concurred in by the whole or the greater part of the society. General peace and order are the attendants of justice, or a general abstinence from the possessions of others, but a particular regard to the particular right of one individual citizen may frequently, considered in itself, be productive of pernicious consequences. 
the result of the individual acts is here in many instances directly opposite to that of the whole system of actions and the former may be extremely hurtful while the latter is to the highest degree advantageous riches inherited from a parent are in a bad man's hand the instrument of mischief the right of succession may in one instance be hurtful its benefit arises only from the observance of the general rule and it is sufficient if compensation be thereby made for all the ills and inconveniences which flow from particular characters and situations cyrus young and unexperienced considered only the individual case before him and reflected on a limited fitness and convenience when he assigned the long coat to the tall boy and the short coat to the other of smaller size his governor instructed him better while he pointed out more enlarged views and consequences and informed his pupil of the general inflexible rules necessary to support general peace and order in society the happiness and prosperity of mankind arising from the social virtue of benevolence and its subdivisions may be compared to a wall built by many hands which still rises by each stone that is heaped upon it and receives increase proportional to the diligence and care of each workman the same happiness raised by the social virtue of justice and its subdivisions may be compared to the building of a vault where each individual stone would of itself fall to the ground nor is the whole fabric supported but by the mutual assistance and combination of its corresponding parts all the laws of nature which regulate property as well as all civil laws are general and regard alone some essential circumstances of the case without taking into consideration the characters situations and connections of the person concerned or any particular consequence which may result from the determination of these laws in any particular case which offers they deprive without scruple a beneficent man of all his possessions if acquired by mistake without a good title in order to bestow them on a selfish miser who has already heaped up immense stores of superfluous riches public utility requires that property should be regulated by general inflexible rules and though such rules are adopted as best serve the same end of public utility it is impossible for them to prevent all particular hardships or make beneficial consequences result from every individual case it is sufficient if the whole plan or scheme be necessary to the support of civil society and if the balance of good in the main do thereby preponderate much above that of evil even the general laws of the universe though planned by infinite wisdom cannot exclude all evil or inconvenience in every particular operation it has been asserted by some that justice arises from human conventions and proceeds from the voluntary choice consent or combination of mankind if by convention be here meant a promise which is the most usual sense of the word nothing can be more absurd than this position the observance of promises is itself one of the most considerable parts of justice and we are not surely bound to keep our word because we have given our word to keep it but if by convention be meant a sense of common interest which sense each man feels in his own breast which he remarks in his fellows and which carries him in concurrence with others into a general plan or system of actions which tends to public utility it must be owned that in this sense justice arises from human conventions for if it be allowed what is indeed evident that the particular consequences of a particular act of justice may be hurtful to the public as well as to individuals it follows that every man in embracing that virtue must have an eye to the whole plan or system and must expect the concurrence of his fellows in the same conduct and behaviour did all his views terminate in the consequences of each act of his own, his benevolence and humanity, as well as his self-love, might often prescribe to him measures of conduct very different from those which are agreeable to the strict rules of right and justice. Thus, two men pull the oars of a boat by common convention for common interest, without any promise or contract. Thus gold and silver are made the measures of exchange, thus speech and words and language are fixed by human convention and agreement whatever is advantageous to two or more persons if all perform their part but what loses all advantage if only one perform can arise from no other principle 
there would otherwise be no motive for any one of them to enter into that scheme of conduct. Footnote. This theory, concerning the origin of property and consequently of justice, is in the main the same with that hinted at and adopted by Grotius. Hinc discimus, quae furit casa, ob quam apramaeva communione rerum primo mobilium, deinde et immobilium dicesum est, nimirum quod cum contenti homines vesce spontinatis, antra habitare, corpore aut nudo agere, aut corticibus arborum ferarumve pelibus vestito, vitae genus exquisitius delegissent, industria opus fuit, quam singuli rebus singulus adhiberent, Cor minus autum fructus in commune conferentur, primum obstitit locorum, in quae homines discesserunt, distantia, deinde justitiae et amoris defectus, per quem fiebat, ut nei in labore, nei in consumtione fructum, quae debebat, aequalitas servaretur. Simul discimus, quomodo res in proprietatum iberint, non animi actu solo, neque enim scire aliae poterant, quid alil suum esse velent, ut eo abstinerent, et idem vele plures poterant, sed pacto quodum aut expresso, ut per divisionum aut tacito, ut per occupationum. De jure belli et pacis, liber due, capitum due, sectione due, Articulo quartem ad quintem. The word natural is commonly taken in so many senses, and is of so loose a signification, that it seems vain to dispute whether justice be natural or not. If self-love, if benevolence be natural to man, if reason and forethought be also natural, then may the same epithet be applied to justice, order, fidelity, property, society. Men's inclination, their necessities lead them to combine. Their understanding and experience tell them that this combination is impossible where each governs himself by no rule, and pays no regard to the possessions of others. And from these passions and reflections conjoined, as soon as we observe like passions and reflections in others, the sentiment of justice throughout all ages has infallibly and certainly had place to some degree or other in every individual of the human species. In so sagacious an animal, what necessarily arises from the exertion of his intellectual faculties may justly be esteemed natural. Footnote. Natural may be opposed, either to what is unusual, miraculous, or artificial. In the two former senses, justice and property are undoubtedly natural. But as they suppose reason, forethought, design, and a social union and confederacy among men, perhaps that epithet cannot strictly, in the last sense, be applied to them. Had men lived without society, property had never been known, and neither justice nor injustice had ever existed. But society among human creatures had been impossible without reason and forethought. Inferior animals that unite are guided by instinct, which supplies the place for reason. But all these disputes are merely verbal. Among all civilized nations, it has been the constant endeavor to remove everything arbitrary and partial from the decision of property, and to fix the sentence of judges by such general views and considerations as may be equal to every member of society. For besides, that nothing could be more dangerous than to accustom the bench, even in the smallest instance, to regard private friendship or enmity, it is certain that men, where they imagine that there was no other reason for the preference of their adversary but personal favour, are apt to entertain the strongest ill-will against the magistrates and judges. When natural reason, therefore, points out no fixed view of public utility by which a controversy of property can be decided, positive laws are often framed to supply its place and direct the procedure of all courts of judicature. Where these two fail, as often happens, precedents are called for, and a former decision, though given itself without any sufficient reason, justly becomes a sufficient reason for a new decision. 
if direct laws and precedents be wanting imperfect and indirect ones are brought in aid and the controverted case is ranged under them by analogical reasonings and comparisons and similitudes and correspondencies which are often more fanciful than real in general it may safely be affirmed that jurisprudence is in this respect different from all the sciences and that in many of its nicer questions there cannot properly be said to be truth or falsehood on either side if one pleader bring the case under any former law or precedent by a refined analogy or comparison the opposite pleader is not at a loss to find an opposite analogy or comparison and the preference given by the judge is often founded more on taste and imagination than on any solid argument public utility is the general object of all courts of judicature and this utility too requires a stable rule in all controversies but where several rules nearly equal and indifferent present themselves it is a very slight turn of thought which fixes the decision in favour of either party footnote that there be a separation or distinction of possessions and that this separation be steady and constant this is absolutely required by the interests of society and hence the origin of justice and property what possessions are assigned to particular persons this is generally speaking pretty indifferent and is often determined by very frivolous views and considerations we shall mention a few particulars were a society formed among several independent members the most obvious rule which could be agreed on would be to annex property to present possession and leave every one a right to what he at present enjoys the relation of possession which takes place between the person and the object naturally draws on the relation of property for a like reason occupation or first possession becomes the foundation of property where a man bestows labour and industry upon any object which before belonged to nobody as in cutting down and shaping a tree in cultivating a field etc the alterations which he produces causes a relation between him and the object and naturally engages us to annex it to him by the new relation of property this cause here concurs with the public utility which consists in the encouragement given to industry and labour Perhaps, too, private humanity towards the possessor concurs, in this instance, with the other motives, and engages us to leave him with what he has acquired by his sweat and labour, and what he has flattered himself in the constant enjoyment of. For, though private humanity can, by no means, be the origin of justice, since the latter virtue so often contradicts the former, yet, when the rule of separate and constant possession is once formed by the indispensable necessities of society, private humanity, and an aversion to the doing a hardship to another, may, in a particular instance, give rise to a particular rule of property. I am much inclined to think that the right succession or inheritance much depends on those connections of the imagination, and that the relation to a former proprietor begetting a relation to the object is the cause why the property is transferred to a man after the death of his kinsman. It is true, industry is more encouraged by the transference of possession to children or near relations, but this consideration will only have place in a cultivated society whereas the right of succession is regarded even among the greatest barbarians acquisition of property by accession can be explained no way but by having recourse to the relations and connections of the imaginations the property of rivers by the laws of most nations and by the natural turn of our thoughts is attributed to the proprietors of their banks excepting such vast rivers as the rhine or the danube which seem too large to follow as an accession to the property of the neighbouring fields yet even these rivers are considered as the property of that nation through whose dominions they run the idea of a nation being of a suitable bulk to correspond with them and bear them such a relation in the fancy the accessions which are made to land bordering upon rivers follow the land say the civilians provided it be made by what they call alluvian that is insensibly and imperceptibly which are circumstances that assist the imagination in the conjunction where there is any considerable portion torn at once from one bank and added to another it becomes not his property whose land it falls on till it unite with the land and till the trees and plants have spread their roots into both before that the thought does not sufficiently join them in short 
we must ever distinguish between the necessity of a separation and constancy in men's possession and the rules which assign particular objects to particular persons. The first necessity is obvious, strong, and invincible. The latter may depend on a public utility more light and frivolous, on the sentiment of private humanity and aversion to private hardship, on positive laws, on precedents, analogies, and very fine connections and turns of the imagination. End of footnote. We may just observe, before we conclude this subject, that after the laws of justice are fixed by views of general utility, the injury, the hardship, the harm which results to any individual from a violation of them enter very much into consideration, and are a great source of that universal blame which attends every wrong or iniquity. By the laws of society, this coat, this horse is mine, and ought to remain perpetually in my possession. I reckon on the secure enjoyment of it. By depriving me of it, you disappoint my expectations, and doubly displease me, and offend every bystander. It is a public wrong, so far as the rules of equity are violated. It is a private harm, so far as an individual is injured. And though the second consideration could have no place, were not the former previously established, for otherwise the distinction of mine and thine would be unknown in society, yet there is no question but the regard to general good is much enforced by the respect to particular. What injures the community, without hurting any individual, is often more lightly thought of. But where the greatest public wrong is also conjoined with a considerable private one, no wonder the highest disapprobation attends so iniquitous a behaviour. End of section 17 Section 18 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Koenig An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume Appendix 4 Of Some Verbal Disputes Nothing is more usual than for philosophers to encroach upon the province of grammarians, and to engage in disputes of words while they imagine that they are handling controversies of the deepest importance and concern. It was in order to avoid altercations so frivolous and endless that I endeavored to state with the utmost caution the object of our present inquiry, and proposed simply to collect, on the one hand, a list of those mental qualities which are the object of love or esteem and form a part of personal merit, and on the other hand, a catalogue of those qualities which are the object of censure or reproach which detract from the character of the person possessed of them, subjoining some reflections concerning the origin of these sentiments of praise or blame. On all occasions where there might arise the least hesitation, I avoided the terms virtue and vice, because some of those qualities which I classed among the objects of praise receive in the English language the appellation of talents rather than of virtues, as some of the blamable or censurable qualities are often called defects rather than vices. It may now perhaps be expected that before we conclude this moral inquiry, we should exactly separate the one from the other, should mark the precise boundaries of virtues and talents, vices and defects, and should explain the reason and origin of that distinction. But in order to excuse myself from this undertaking, which would at last prove only a grammatical inquiry, I shall subjoin the four following reflections, which shall contain all that I intend to say on the present subject. First, I do not find that in the English, or any other modern tongue, the boundaries are exactly fixed between virtues and talents, vices and defects, or that a precise definition can be given of the one as contradistinguished from the other. Were we to say, for instance, that the esteemable qualities alone which are voluntary are entitled to the appellations of virtues, we should soon recollect the qualities of courage, equanimity, patience, self-command, with many others which almost every language classes under this appellation, though they depend little or not at all on our choice. Should we affirm that the qualities alone which prompt us to act our part in society are entitled to that honorable distinction, it must immediately occur that these are indeed the most valuable qualities, and are commonly denominated the social virtues, but that this very epithet supposes that they are also virtues of another species. Should we lay hold of the distinction between intellectual and moral endowments, 
and affirm the last alone to be the real and genuine virtues because they alone lead to action we should find that many of those qualities usually called intellectual virtues such as prudence penetration discernment discretion had also a considerable influence on conduct the distinction between the heart and the head may also be adopted the qualities of the first may be defined such as in their immediate exertion are accompanied with a feeling of sentiment and these alone may be called the genuine virtues but industry frugality temperance secrecy perseverance and many other laudable powers or habits generally styled virtues are exerted without any immediate sentiment in the person possessed of them and are only known to them by their effects it is fortunate amidst all this seeming perplexity that the question being merely verbal cannot possibly be of any importance a moral philosophical discourse need not enter into all these caprices of language which are so variable in different dialects and in different ages of the same dialect but on the whole it seems to me that though it is always allowed that there are virtues of many different kinds yet when a man is called virtuous or is denominated a man of virtue we chiefly regard his social qualities which are indeed the most valuable it is at the same time certain that any remarkable defect in courage temperance economy industry understanding dignity of mind would bereave even a very good-natured honest man of this honourable appellation who did ever say except by way of irony that such a one was a man of great virtue but an egregious blockhead but secondly it is no wonder that languages should not be very precise in marking the boundaries between virtues and talents vices and defects since there is so little distinction made in our internal estimation of them. It seems indeed certain that the sentiment of conscious worth, the self-satisfaction proceeding from a review of a man's own conduct and character, it seems certain, I say, that this sentiment, which, though the most common of all others, has no proper name in our language, arises from the endowments of courage and capacity, industry and ingenuity, as well as from any other mental excellencies. Footnote the term pride is commonly taken in a bad sense but this sentiment seems indifferent and may be either good or bad according as it is well or ill-founded and according to the other circumstances which accompany it the french express this sentiment by the term amour propre but as they also express self-love as well as vanity by the same term there arises thence a great confusion in rochefoucauld and many of their moral writers End footnote who, on the other hand, is not deeply mortified with reflecting on his own folly and dissoluteness, and feels not a secret sting or compunction whenever his memory presents any past occurrence where he behaved with stupidity or ill manners. No time can efface the cruel ideas of a man's own foolish conduct, or of affronts which cowardice or impudence has brought upon him. They still haunt his solitary hours, damp his most aspiring thoughts, and show him even to himself in the most contemptible and most odious colours imaginable. What is there, too, we are more anxious to conceal from others than such blunders, infirmities, and meannesses, or more dread to have exposed by raillery and satire? And is not the chief object of vanity, our bravery or learning, our wit or breeding, our eloquence or address, our taste or abilities? These we display with care, if not with ostentation and we commonly show more ambition of excelling in them than even in the social virtues themselves, which are in reality of such superior excellence. Good nature and honesty, especially the latter, are so indispensably required that, though the greatest censure attends any violation of these duties, no eminent praise follows such common instances of them as seem essential to the support of human society. And hence the reason, in my opinion, why, though men often extol so liberally the qualities of their heart, they are shy in commending the endowments of their head, because the latter virtues, being supposed more rare and extraordinary, are observed to be the more usual objects of pride and self-conceit, and when boasted of beget a strong suspicion of these sentiments. It is hard to tell whether you hurt a man's character most by calling him a knave or a coward, and whether a beastly glutton or drunkard be not as odious and contemptible as a selfish, ungenerous miser, Give me my choice, and I would rather, for my own happiness and self-enjoyment, have a friendly, humane heart than possess all the other virtues of Demosthenes and Philip united. But I would rather pass with the world for one endowed with extensive genius and intrepid courage, and should thence expect stronger instances of general applause and admiration. The figure which a man makes in life, the reception which he meets with in company, the esteem paid him by his acquaintance, 
All these advantages depend as much upon his good sense and judgment as upon any other part of his character. Had a man the best intentions in the world and were the farthest removed from all injustice and violence, he would never be able to make himself be much regarded without a moderate share, at least, of parts and understanding. What is it, then, we can here dispute about? If sense and courage, temperance and industry, wisdom and knowledge confessedly form a considerable part of personal merit, if a man, possessed of these qualities, is both better satisfied with himself and better entitled to the good will, esteem, and services of others than one entirely destitute of them, if, in short, the sentiments are similar which arise from these endowments and from the social virtues, is there any reason for being so extremely scrupulous about a word, or disputing whether they be entitled to the denomination of virtues? It may indeed be pretended that the sentiment of approbation which those accomplishments produce, besides its being inferior, is also somewhat different from that which attends the virtues of justice and humanity. But this seems not a sufficient reason for ranking them entirely under different classes and appellations. The character of Caesar and that of Cato, as drawn by Sallust, are both of them virtuous, in the strictest and most limited sense of the word, but in a different way, nor are the sentiments entirely the same which arise from them. The one produces love, the other esteem. The one is amiable, the other awful. We should wish to meet the one character in a friend, the other we should be ambitious of in ourselves. In like manner, the approbation which attends temperance or industry or frugality may be somewhat different from that which is paid to the social virtues, without making them entirely of different species. And indeed we may observe that these endowments, more than the other virtues, produce not, all of them, the same kind of approbation. Good sense and genius beget esteem and regard, wit and humor excite love and affection. Footnote. Love and esteem are nearly the same passion, and arise from similar causes. The qualities which produce both are such as communicate pleasures, but where this pleasure is severe and serious, or where its object is great and makes a strong impression, or where it produces any degree of humility and awe, in all of these cases the passion which arises from the pleasure is more properly denominated esteem than love. Benevolence attends both, but is connected with love in a more eminent degree. There seems to be still a stronger mixture of pride and contempt than of humility and esteem, and the reason would not be difficult to one who studied accurately the passions. All these various mixtures and compositions and appearances of sentiment form a very curious subject of speculation, but are wide for our present purpose. Throughout this inquiry, we always consider in general what qualities are a subject of praise or of censure, without entering into all the minute differences of sentiment which they excite. It is evident that whatever is contemned is also disliked, as well as what is hated and we here endeavor to take objects according to their most simple views and appearances. These sciences are but too apt to appear abstract to common readers, even with all the precautions which we can take to clear them from superfluous speculations and bring them down to every capacity. End footnote. Most people, I believe, will naturally, without premeditation, assent to the definition of the elegant and judicious poet. Virtue, for mere good nature is a fool, is sense and spirit with humanity. What pretensions has a man to our generous assistance or good offices, who has dissipated his wealth in profuse expenses, idle vanities, chimerical projects, dissolute pleasures, or extravagant gaming? These vices, for we scruple not to call them such, bring misery unpitied and contempt on every one addicted to them. Achaeus, a wise and prudent prince, fell into a fatal snare which cost him his crown and life, after having used every reasonable precaution to guard himself against it. On that account, said the historian, he is a just object of regard and compassion, his betrayers alone of hatred and contempt. The precipitate flight and improvident negligence of Pompey, at the beginning of the civil wars, appeared such notorious blunders to Cicero as quite palled his friendship toward that great man. In the same manner, says he, as want of cleanliness, decency, or discretion in a mistress are found to alienate our affections for so he expresses himself, where he talks not in the character of a philosopher, but in that of a statesman and man of the world, to his friend Atticus. But the same Cicero, in imitation of all the ancient moralists, when he reasons as a philosopher, enlarges very much his ideas of virtue, and comprehends every laudable quality or endowment of the mind under that honorable appellation. This leads to the third reflection which we propose to make, to wit, that the ancient moralists, the best models, 
made no material distinction among the different species of mental endowments and defects, but treated all alike under the appellation of virtues and vices, and made them indiscriminately the object of their moral reasonings. The prudence explained in Cicero's offices is that sagacity which leads to the discovery of truth, and preserves us from error and mistake. Magnanimity, temperance, decency, are there also at large discoursed of. And as that eloquent moralist followed the common received division of the four cardinal virtues, our social duties form but one head in the general distribution of his subject. Footnote. The following passage of Cicero is worth quoting, as being the most clear and express to our purpose that anything can be imagined, and in a dispute which is chiefly verbal, must, on account of the author, carry an authority from which there can be no appeal. Virtus autem, quaes per se ipsa laudabilis, et sine qua nihil laudari potest, tamen habet plures partes quarum alia est alia ad laudationem aptio. Sunt enim aliae virtutes quae videntur in moribus hominum, et quadem comitate ac beneficentia positae, aliae quae in ingenii aliqua facultate, aut animi magnitudine ac robore, nam clementia, justitia, benignitas, fides, fortitudo in periculis communibus, jucunda est auditu in laudationibus. Omnes enim hae virtutes non tam ipsis qui ea sense habent, quam generi hominum fructuosae putantur, sapientia et magnitudo animi, qua omnes res humanae tenues pro nihilo putantur, et in cogitando vis quaedam ingenii, et ipsa eloquentia admirationes habet non minus, jucunditatis minus. Ipsos enim magis videntur quos laudamus, quam illos apud quos laudamus onare actueri, sed tamen in laudanda jungenda sunt etiam haec genera virtutum. Ferunt enim aures hominum, cum illa quae jucunda et grata, tum etiam illa quae mirabilia sunt in virtute laudari. De Oratore, Book 2, Chapter 84 I suppose, if Cicero were now alive, it would be found difficult to fetter his moral sentiments by narrow systems, or persuade him that no qualities were to be admitted as virtues, or acknowledged to be a part of personal merit, but what were recommended by the whole duty of man. End footnote. We need only peruse the titles of chapters in Aristotle's Ethics to be convinced that he ranks courage, temperance, magnificence, magnanimity, modesty, prudence, and a manly openness among the virtues, as well as justice and friendship. To sustain and to abstain, that is, to be patient and continent, appeared to some of the ancients a summary comprehension of all morals. Epictetus has scarcely ever mentioned the sentiment of humanity and compassion, but in order to put his disciples on their guard against it. The virtue of the Stoics seems to consist chiefly in a firm temper and a sound understanding. With them, as with Solomon and the Eastern moralists, folly and wisdom are equivalent to vice and virtue. Men will praise thee, says David, when thou dost well unto thyself. I hate a wise man, says the Greek poet, who is not wise to himself. Plutarch is no more cramped by systems in his philosophy than in his history, where he compares the great men of Greece and Rome, he fairly sets in opposition all their blemishes and accomplishments of whatever kind, and omits nothing considerable which can either depress or exalt their characters. His moral discourses contain the same free and natural censure of men and manners. The character of Hannibal, as drawn by Livy, is esteemed partial, but allows him many eminent virtues— Never was there a genius, says the historian, more equally fitted for those opposite offices of commanding and obeying, and it were, therefore, difficult to determine whether he rendered himself dearer to the general or to the army. To none would Hasdrubal entrust more willingly the conduct of any dangerous enterprise. Under none did the soldiers discover more courage and confidence. Great boldness in facing danger, great prudence in the midst of it. No labor could fatigue his body or subdue his mind. Cold and heat were indifferent to him. Meat and drink he sought as supplies to the necessities of nature, not as gratifications of his voluptuous appetites. Waking or rest he used indiscriminately, by night or by day. These great virtues were balanced by great vices. Inhuman cruelty, perfidy more than punic, no truth, no faith, no regard to oaths, promises, or religion. The character of Alexander the Sixth, to be found in Guichardin, is pretty similar, but juster, and is a proof that even the moderns, where they speak naturally, hold the same language with the ancients. 
In this pope, says he, there was a singular capacity in judgment, admirable prudence, a wonderful talent of persuasion, and in all momentous enterprises a diligence and dexterity incredible. But these virtues were infinitely overbalanced by his vices. No faith, no religion, insatiable avarice, exorbitant ambition, and a more than barbarous cruelty. Polybius, reprehending Timaeus for his partiality against Agathocles, whom he himself allows to be the most cruel and impious of all tyrants, says, If he took refuge in Syracuse, as asserted by that historian, flying the dirt and smoke and toil of his former profession of a potter, and if proceeding from such slender beginnings he became master in a little time of all Sicily, brought the Carthaginian state into the utmost danger, and at last died in old age, and in possession of sovereign dignity, must he not be allowed something prodigious and extraordinary, and to have possessed great talents and capacity for business and action? His historian, therefore, ought not to have alone related what tended to his reproach and infamy, but also what might redound to his praise and honor. In general, we may observe that the distinction of voluntary or involuntary was little regarded by the ancients in their moral reasonings, where they frequently treated the question as very doubtful whether virtue could be taught or not. They justly considered that cowardice, meanness, levity, anxiety, impatience, folly, and many other qualities of the mind might appear ridiculous and deformed, contemptible and odious, though independent of the will. Nor could it be supposed at all times in every man's power to attain every kind of mental more than of exterior beauty. And here there occurs the fourth reflection which I purpose to make, in suggesting the reason why modern philosophers have often followed a course in their moral inquiries so different from that of the ancients. In later times, philosophy of all kinds, especially ethics, have been more closely united with theology than ever they were observed to be among the heathens. And as this latter science admits of no terms of composition, but bends every branch of knowledge to its own purpose, without much regard to the phenomena of nature or to the unbiased sentiments of the mind, hence reasoning and even language have been warped from their natural course, and distinctions have been endeavored to be established where the difference of the objects was in a manner imperceptible. Philosophers, or rather divines under that disguise, treating all morals as on a like footing with civil laws, guarded by the sanctions of reward and punishment, were necessarily led to render this circumstance, of voluntary or involuntary, the foundation of their whole theory. Every one may employ terms in what sense he pleases, but this in the meantime must be allowed, that sentiments are every day experienced of blame and praise which have objects beyond the dominion of the will or choice, and of which it behooves us, if not as moralists, as speculative philosophers at least, to give some satisfactory theory and explication. A blemish, a fault, a vice, a crime. These expressions seem to denote different degrees of censure and disapprobation, which are, however, all of them at the bottom pretty nearly all the same kind of species. The explication of one will easily lead us into a just conception of the others, and it is of greater consequence to attend to things than to verbal appellations. That we owe a duty to ourselves is confessed even in the most vulgar system of morals, and it must be of consequence to examine that duty, in order to see whether it bears any affinity to that which we owe to society. It is probable that the approbation attending the observance of both is of a similar nature, and arises from similar principles, whatever appellation we may give to either of these excellencies. End of section 18. Recording by Amy Koenig. End of an inquiry concerning the principles of morals by David Hume.